Welcome to my recap of every Spider-Man movie, where I cover the Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland films, the Spider-Verse movies, and the Spider-Man adjacent movies, including both Venoms and, of course, Morbius, plus a little something extra at the end. Use the chapter markers if you want to skip to your favorites, or just sit back and enjoy. Peter Parker is the school nerd, picked on by all except two people. First, there's Mary Jane Watson, the girl next door he's loved since he was a child, who is currently dating Flash Thompson, and the other is his best friend Harry Osborn, the rich kid and son of scientist entrepreneur Norman Osborn. Norman is strict as a father and disappointed that Harry is yet to live up to his intellectual standards. In fact, he's more impressed with Peter, who shows an aptitude for science. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. On a field trip to a science lab, Parker suffers his usual bad luck, watching his best friend flirt with his lifelong crush. Then, a genetically engineered super spider escapes its shelter and bites Peter. At Oscorp, Norman vies for a military contract by showing off their new glider. But their human performance enhancers aren't ready yet. Rats showed an 800% increase in strength, but one test case showed unusual violence, aggression, and insanity. Regardless, Norman wants to push ahead with human trials, while Dr. Strom insists on going back to formula. Back to formula? Dr. Osborne! The military representatives threaten to pull funding if Norman can't show a successful human trial within two weeks. Peter returns home to his Uncle Ben and Aunt May, who raised him in his parents' absence. Though he skips dinner and heads straight to bed, not feeling well after the spider bite. He passes out while, internally, the super spider DNA combines with his own. At the lab, Osborne recklessly tests the performance enhancers on himself. The effects are immediate, as Osborne kills Dr. Strom in a blind rage. The next morning, Peter finds his eyesight repaired, he now sports an impressive physique, and his hand is sticky. At school, MJ ignores Peter as usual until she slips and Peter uses his new reflexes to catch her and her lunch. Wow, great reflexes. And for the first time, she notices him. Hey, you have blue eyes. I, I didn't notice without your glasses. The moment of glory is short-lived as spiderwebs suddenly spurt from Peter's wrists. Trying to escape unnoticed, Peter accidentally flings a lunch tray at Flash Thompson, who later attacks in retaliation. Peter easily dodges the bully's attacks and defeats him in one punch. Later, Peter tests his abilities, finding that he can climb on walls, leap from building to building, and shoot webs from his hand like a grappling hook, though it takes a few tries. Up, up, and away, web! Shazam! Go! Go! Go, web, go! That night, Peter gets home to find his uncle painted the kitchen alone, a chore Peter was supposed to help with. And across the street, he hears MJ's alcoholic father yelling at her. Peter takes out the trash as she steps outside for fresh air, and the two chat about their upcoming graduation. He hopes to move to Manhattan, take a job as a photographer, and work his way through college. She wants to move to the city too, and become an actress. She's embarrassed at the admission, but Peter believes in her. You're awesome in all the school plays. Really? Yeah. The next day, Peter sees an ad in the paper for amateur wrestling, which calls for colorful characters. So he sketches himself a spider-themed costume. Later, Uncle Ben talks to Peter about his behavior lately, shirking chores and beating up Flash Thompson. Remember, his uncle says, With great power comes great responsibility. Peter shouts for him to stop pretending to be his father, then storms off. At the wrestling match, participants are offered three grand if they can last three minutes with Bonesaw. Peter signs up under the name The Human Spider, but the announcer instead introduces him as The Amazing Spider-Man! He easily defeats Bonesaw, but the organizer refuses to pay him the full amount since the deal was to last three minutes and Spider-Man won far quicker than that. As Peter leaves, a man points a gun at the organizer and robs him. When the thief runs off, Peter lets him go, feeling no sympathy for the organizer that refused him full payment. On the way home, Peter finds cops tending to a wounded man, his Uncle Ben, shot by a carjacker. Peter watches his uncle die, then chases the assailant as he gets the hang of swinging through the city with webs. 
He corners his uncle's killer at a warehouse and recognizes him as the crook he didn't stop earlier. When the man pulls a gun, Peter disarms him and breaks his wrist. The criminal stumbles backwards, then trips and falls out of the warehouse to his death. Peter returns home and comforts his now widowed aunt. In a desert, the military rep that threatened Norman watches Oscorp's competitor test out their exoskeleton, in place of the failed human performance enhancers. But they're interrupted by Norman Osborne's cackling as he flies in on the glider and blows them up. The next day, Peter and Harry graduate high school. Norman congratulates Harry on not flunking out, then Peter for his science award. Meanwhile, MJ breaks up with Flash Thompson, and Harry notices. That night, Peter misses his uncle and cries. Aunt May comforts him. Later, Peter looks at the costume he drew and thinks of his uncle's words. With great power comes great responsibility. In the days that follow, he dons a new costume while stopping crimes and saving lives. The city comes to know him as a hero named Spider-Man. But one man sees him as a menace, J. Jonah Jameson, editor of major newspaper The Daily Bugle. But Spider-Man sells papers, so Jameson asks for his photo to be splayed on the front cover. Unfortunately, no one can get a decent picture of him, so he puts out a bounty. Put an ad on the front page. Cash money for a picture of Spider-Man. He doesn't want to be famous, and I'll make him infamous. While looking for a job, Peter runs into MJ and finds out she's dating his friend and now roommate, Harry Osborn. Later, he sees the Daily Bugle ad asking for photos of Spider-Man. So the next time he fights crime, he sets up a camera to take continuous photos. At the Bugle, Jameson calls the picture as crap, but buys them and agrees to work with Peter as a freelancer, turning down Peter's request to get hired full-time. At Oscorp, the board informs Norman that they've decided to sell the company to Quest, and one of the terms of the agreement is that Norman be let go as CEO. The deal is to be announced after Oscorp's World Unity Festival. Norman is not happy about being fired. You know how much I sacrifice! At the festival, Harry is disappointed in MJ. She didn't wear the black dress like he wanted, the one he thought would impress his father. Meanwhile, Peter takes pictures for the bugle, until he suddenly senses danger, thanks to his spider sense, a nearly precognitive ability to anticipate threats inherited from the super spider. Norman arrives on his glider dressed in a green costume. He kills the board of directors that fired him and nearly kills others in the crossfire. But Peter quickly becomes Spider-Man to stave off Osborn and rescue the bystanders. When Spider-Man damages the glider, Norman flies off and vows they will face each other again soon. Meanwhile, a balcony collapses thanks to damage caused by Norman, and Peter catches a falling MJ, then swings her to safety. As he flies off, MJ watches whimsically. She later tells Harry how incredible Spider-Man was and he gets jealous, while Peter overhears their phone call with a self-congratulating smile. Afterward, Harry apologizes for dating Peter's crush, but adds, It's just, you know, you never made a move. Elsewhere, Norman hallucinates a twisted version of his own voice speaking to him. Don't play the innocent with me. Through his reflection in the mirror, his evil alter ego tells Norman how he killed the board members. Norman is horrified to learn he's going insane thanks to the performance enhancers. Then the reflection tells him they'll be able to gain so much power, but first, they need to get rid of Spider-Man, either by killing him or recruiting him. At the Bugle, Jameson names the new villain the Green Goblin, just before the Goblin himself shows up and chokes him, demanding to know who brings in the photos of Spider-Man. But the newspaper editor protects Parker's identity, saying the photos come in anonymously. Then Spider-Man comes to the rescue, and the Green Goblin knocks him out with noxious gas. When Peter wakes, the Goblin tells Spider-Man that, despite the hero he's been, the city will eventually turn against him. Instead, the Goblin offers an alliance. He tells Spider-Man to think about it, then flies off. The next issue of the Daily Bugle falsely claims that Spider-Man teamed up with the Goblin to terrorize Jameson. And with the paper's influence, citizens begin turning against Spider-Man, just like Norman promised they would. Later, Peter checks in on MJ after a failed audition and offers a conciliatory cheeseburger. But she has dinner with Harry. Peter asks how things are going with him, but quickly stops himself. 
MJ's expression shows that things aren't going very well with Harry, and coyly asks why Peter is so interested. Then, before leaving, she says, I better run, Tiger. He notices some thugs follow her, so he changes to Spider-Man and comes to the rescue. She thanks him, and while he hangs upside down in the rain, she rolls up his mask to just below his nose, and they kiss. The next day, the Green Goblin sets an apartment building on fire to bait Spider-Man. Peter rescues a baby, then returns to search for more survivors, but only finds the Goblin. Peter turns down his proposal for an alliance, so Norman attacks and wounds Spider-Man's arm before he escapes. Later, Aunt May hosts a Thanksgiving dinner with MJ and the Osbournes. Before they say grace, Norman notices the wound on Peter's arm, giving away that he's Spider-Man. Norman excuses himself, and Harry goes after him, saying he was excited for him to meet MJ. Norman loudly tells his son that the girl is just after his money. Inside, Peter, Aunt May, and MJ hear the whole thing. MJ storms off while Harry pitifully defends his father. Elsewhere, Norman's twisted alter ego demands he make Peter suffer by going after his loved ones. So the Green Goblin pays Aunt May a visit and terrorizes her. Peter finds her in the hospital and overhears her ramblings about those horrible yellow eyes. Later, MJ visits May and Peter at the hospital. She tells Peter that she's been ignoring Harry's phone calls. The fact is, she's in love with somebody else, Spider-Man. Peter tells her that he's kind of Spider-Man's unofficial photographer and Spider-Man actually asked him what he thought of MJ. Peter tells her what he said, about the whirlwind of emotions you feel staring into Mary Jane's eyes, and she's touched by his words. Aunt May slyly listens, pretending to be asleep, while MJ takes Peter's hand just as Harry walks in to witness their closeness. He returns home and tells his dad that he was right about MJ. She doesn't love him, she loves Peter, and Peter's been in love with MJ since the fourth grade. Norman quietly takes note of this important person in Spider-Man's life as another potential victim, then comforts his son with a hug. At the hospital, Aunt May encourages Peter to tell MJ how much he cares about her. Everyone else knows, and it occurs to Peter that everyone else may include the Green Goblin, and MJ might be in danger. He runs to call MJ, but the Green Goblin answers and tells him where to find her on top of the Queensboro Bridge. The goblin rips a trolley car full of children from its tracks, then gives Peter a choice, save them or save MJ. He drops both, and rather than choose, Spider-Man catches MJ, then the trolley. He holds them both, making it near impossible to fight off the goblin's attacks. But Spider-Man isn't alone. Citizens on the bridge throw trash and other objects at the goblin, which gives Peter a chance to safely lower MJ and the trolley to a barge below. The goblin chases Peter to an abandoned building where they have their final showdown. Peter nearly defeats him until the villain unmasks to reveal his identity. Seeing his friend's father, Peter hesitates. Until the goblin calls for his glider, Peter dodges the attack and the machine strikes Norman instead, impaling him against the wall. Peter, he says. Don't tell Harry. Then he dies. Spider-Man returns the dead man's body to his home, but before he can flee, Harry spots him. And at Norman's funeral, he vows revenge on Spider-Man for killing his father. Looking at his uncle's grave, Peter realizes that no matter what he does, everyone he loves will suffer. So when MJ confesses her love for him and kisses him, Peter walks away. And to the heartbroken MJ, the kiss feels familiar. Two years later, Peter struggles to balance his life as Peter Parker with his responsibilities as Spider-Man. He loses his job as a pizza delivery man and makes only meager funds when he turns in pictures of Spider-Man, which J. Jonah Jameson just uses as fodder for more slanderous stories in the Daily Bugle. At the university, Dr. Connors chides Peter for missing class again and for his steadily declining grades. He also reminds Peter that his paper on Dr. Otto Octavius' fusion project is overdue. Later, Peter walks into a surprise party thrown by his Aunt May, along with Harry and MJ. It takes a second for him to remember that it's his birthday, and it takes just one more second for his friends to ask why he's been so unavailable and distant lately. 
Peter asks about Oscorp, and Harry shares that he's now the head of special projects. In fact, they're funding one of Peter's idols, Otto Octavius. Harry offers to arrange a meeting. He also gestures to MJ and tells Pete that she's clearly still in love with him. She's waiting for you, pal. The subject changes to Spider-Man and Peter's photography of him. Seething with hatred, Harry asks Peter if he knew who Spider-Man was, would he tell him? When Pete doesn't answer, Harry walks away. Later, while his exhausted aunt sleeps, Peter spots a foreclosure notice. When she wakes, she offers Pete $20 for his birthday, and when he refuses, she responds, For God's sake, it's not much, now take it! Outside, Peter runs into MJ, and she tells him how she liked seeing him tonight. She waits for him to make a move, but is, as always, disappointed. She tells him that she's seeing someone now, and senses Peter's jealousy. He breaks the awkwardness by telling her that, He'll finally see her play tomorrow night. Before leaving, she says, Don't disappoint me. I won't. Back home, Mr. Ditkovich gives Peter a hard time for his late rent. Then Pete returns to his humble apartment. The next day, Harry introduces Pete to Otto Octavius, who heard from Connors that Peter is brilliant. He also tells me you're lazy. Otto tells Peter about his fusion project, which will bring the world nearly limitless and clean energy. Peter is concerned about the stability of the reaction, but Otto assures him he's aware of the risks and accounted for them. Throughout their conversation, Otto is impressed with Peter's scientific acumen. Oh, Rosie, I love this boy. On the night of MJ's play, Peter dresses up, picks up some flowers, and disappoints his friend when duty calls. As Spider-Man, he saves some innocent lives and stops some criminals. But as Peter Parker, he has little luck. At the theater, the usher will not allow him in since the play is in progress. Afterward, Peter watches from a distance as MJ kisses the man she's seeing. Though she gives one more glance to see if Peter is around, but she just misses him. When Peter swings through the city as Spider-Man, he suddenly finds that his webs won't shoot. So he falls and crashes to the ground. The next day, Peter calls MJ and leaves an apologetic message, but it does little to assuage her frustration. Peter wishes he could tell her the truth that he's Spider-Man, so she'd know why he's always late or doesn't show up, but he knows that would put her in danger. Later, Peter and Harry attend Otto's fusion energy demonstration. In order to work with the dangerous materials, Otto's developed four metallic arms. They fuse into his cerebellum so he can control them like his own appendages. They also have an artificial intelligence of their own, but an inhibitor chip ensures Otto controls them, and they do not control him. The fusion reaction depends on a precious material called tritium. There's only 25 pounds of it on the planet. Otto inserts the material and begins the fusion reaction. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. But the reaction grows unstable and dangerous, attracting metal from around the room. Peter disappears, while Harry orders Otto to shut it down, but Otto assures it'll stabilize. When flying debris nearly kills Harry, Spider-Man saves him. Spider-Man tries to shut down the reaction, but Otto stops him. Then, shattered glass kills Otto's wife, and the reaction destroys the inhibitor chip, leaving him vulnerable to the AI. Then, Peter finally shuts down the reaction. At a lab, doctors attempt to remove the metal arms from Otto's body, but the arms come to life and slaughter the doctors. Then, Otto wakes and sees the damage caused by his machines. Otto returns to his destroyed lab, where the uninhibited AI turns him mad and tells him to rebuild. And it tells him to steal the money he'll need to do it. So he visits a local bank and rips the doors off the safe. The same bank where Peter and his aunt are inquiring about a loan. Peter runs off to become Spider-Man. Don't leave me! Oh, that boy of yours is a real hero. He fights the mad scientist, but once again, his webs fail him, and Doc Ock takes Aunt May hostage. He pursues the villain as his webs begin to work again, and ultimately rescues his aunt, but Otto gets away with the money. That night, Peter attends an event as the Daily Bugle's photographer, where J. Jonah Jameson's son, an astronaut, is being honored. And the astronaut is attended by his girlfriend, Mary Jane Watson. Peter watches, heartbroken. He finds her later and tries to apologize again for missing her play, but she is unimpressed, and tells him that she can't keep thinking about him. 
It's too painful. Then a drunk Harry approaches Peter and chastises him for his loyalty to Spider-Man, the man who killed his father. Finally, Peter is crushed by an announcement from Captain John Jameson. That the beautiful Miss Mary Jane Watson has just agreed to marry me. That night, his powers fail him again and he crashes in a dark alley. He also finds his eyesight failing as he reads the Bugle's latest headline, Spidey and Ock Rob Bank. As Doc Ock uses his funds to rebuild his lab, Peter has a vision of Uncle Ben and tells him, I'm Spider-Man. No more. He throws his costume in the trash and walks away. In the next few days, he is the old, powerless Peter Parker, the one who has bad luck, doesn't fight crimes, and gets good grades, and the one who attends Mary Jane's place. He tells MJ that he's changed, and he can now be there for her, but she says that it's too late. She's engaged to John, and that is not going to change. One day, Peter and his Aunt May visit Uncle Ben's grave. She blames herself for his death. She was the one that suggested Ben pick Peter up. But Peter finally confesses that he is the one responsible. He tells her about a thief he had a chance to stop, but didn't. A thief who went on to kill his uncle. Peter grabs her hand, but she pulls it away and leaves the room. Doc Ock visits Harry and demands more tritium for a larger fusion experiment. When threatened, Harry agrees on the condition that Ock bring him Spider-Man, alive. Harry adds that Spider-Man can be found through Peter Parker, the kid who takes pictures of him. Elsewhere, Peter comes across a burning building and finally decides to be a hero again, with or without the costume. He runs in and rescues a child, though he later learns there was one more person in the building who never made it out. Later, the landlord's daughter offers Peter some chocolate cake and watches with the unmistakable look of a girl with a crush. Then, at Aunt May's house, he finds her packing up to move into a small apartment, one she can afford. Peter tries to apologize for his last visit, but she stops him. She says it's water under the bridge, and it was brave of Peter to tell her the truth about Uncle Ben. Then, she says I love you and hugs him. She also tells Peter how people need heroes and how sometimes heroes have to give up the thing they want the most, even their dreams. With his mind cleared, Peter focuses and tries to use his powers again, but he falls again. Later, MJ asks Peter to meet her at a cafe. It seems Peter's been on her mind and she's ready to give things another shot, but Peter quickly tells her that he was wrong before. He thought he could be there for her, but he can't. He leaves off the reason that he's decided to be Spider-Man again. Frustrated, she asks, Do you love me or not? And he responds, I don't. She doesn't believe him and asks him to kiss her. But as they lean forward, his spider sense activates. A car crashes through the cafe and Peter tackles MJ to safety. Then Ock appears and demands Peter tell Spider-Man to meet him at the West Side Tower at 3 o'clock. He takes MJ with him as collateral and tosses Peter into the debris. Peter crashes out of the destroyed cafe. Suddenly, he finds his eyesight restored and his strength returned. At the Daily Bugle, Jameson keeps Spider-Man's costume on the wall. Someone found it in the trash and sold it to him for a hundred bucks. But Peter takes it back, leaving a note behind. Spider-Man returns and meets Ock at the tower. Their fight takes them from the top of the tower onto a moving subway car. Then, the villain realizes Spider-Man's weakness, innocent lives. He tosses two bystanders, but Peter quickly catches them. So, Ock sets the subway car to its fastest speed, removes the brakes, and takes off. You have a train to catch. Sparks from the broken control panel force Peter to remove his mask. Then, as the train careens toward a dead end, Peter stands in front of it, and spreads his arms to fire webs onto any buildings nearby. He holds on tight and depletes every ounce of his strength as his body and webs force the train to stop. When he collapses from exhaustion, the citizens catch him and set him on the floor. They're shocked by what they see. He's just a kid, and older than my son. They promise to keep his face a secret and return his mask. Then, Ock returns. The citizens stand in his path to protect the exhausted hero, but he easily brushes them aside and delivers Spider-Man to Harry Osborn. Osborn hands over the tritium and Ock leaves. Then, Harry draws a knife and prepares to kill Spider-Man, but first unmasks him. 
Peter wakes up and frees himself from the restraints. He asks where Ak is keeping MJ, but Harry says he just wanted the tritium. Peter realizes the mad scientist must be rebuilding the machine, which will kill MJ and half the city. But Harry doesn't care about that right now. Instead, he says, Peter, you killed my father. There are bigger things happening here than me and you. Harry, please, I've got to stop him. Spider-Man arrives at the lab, just as Otto activates the machine. Peter frees MJ and electrocutes the villain, but the unstable reaction continues to grow. Peter runs to the dazed scientist and reveals his identity. Dr. Octavius, we have to shut it down. Please tell me how. Octavius smiles. Peter Parker, brilliant but lazy. Then the tentacles take over again and he refuses to destroy the reaction. Peter begs him to remember the benevolent scientist he always was and ignore the monstrous tentacles. His words work. Dr. Octavius looks at the mechanical appendages and orders them, Listen to me now. He tells Peter to go while he stays behind to stop the reaction by drowning it in the river. Peter shares one last look with Octavius, then it turns to see MJ and she sees him without his mask. Then the building collapses, but Peter catches the debris just in time to save her. As he struggles to hold it, Peter tells her, MJ, in case we die. But he doesn't need to finish. She knows that he loves her. You do love me. I do. Meanwhile, Octavius promises himself that he will not die a monster. He pulls the structure down into the river, drowning it and himself. Peter tosses away the debris and escapes with MJ, so they can finally talk plainly. I think I always knew, she says. So you know why we can't be together, he adds. Spider-Man will always have enemies. I can't let you take that risk. I will always be Spider-Man. You and I can never be. Elsewhere, Harry Osborn stews in his home and suddenly hears the laughter of the Green Goblin. The vision of his father appears behind a mirror and demands Harry avenge him. But Peter is his best friend. Harry resists, throwing his knife at the mirror, revealing the secret hideout behind it, where Norman kept his goblin suit, pumpkin bombs, performance enhancer, and the glider. On the day of her wedding, MJ abandons John at the altar and instead runs to Peter. She tells Peter that she knows the risks, but it's her decision to make, and she wants to face those risks with him. Finally, they kiss, and in the distance they hear a siren. Go get him, tiger. And Spider-Man swings toward danger to save the day. One year later, things are going well for Peter. The city loves Spider-Man, he's at the top of his class in school, and of course, he's in love. Things between him and MJ are great, but not everything is perfect. His friend Harry still isn't speaking to him, and unbeknownst to Peter, Harry is taking the same performance enhancers that turned his father into the Green Goblin. One night, while Peter is out with MJ, a meteorite crashes, and a gooey black alien substance crawls off it and onto Peter's bike. Elsewhere, escaped convict Flint Marco evades the police and visits his sick daughter, Penny. But her mother catches him and the two fight. Before he leaves, Flint promises Penny that one way or another, he will get the money they need for her treatment, and they will make her better. At Aunt May's apartment, Peter announces that he plans on asking MJ to marry him. She of course gives her blessing and gives Peter the ring that Ben once gave her. On the way home, Peter is attacked by Harry Osborn using upgraded goblin gear. You knew this was coming, Pete. In the fight, Peter tries telling the truth. Listen to me! I didn't kill your father! But Harry doesn't listen, and in the ensuing struggle, Peter knocks Harry unconscious. When he sees his friend isn't breathing, Peter administers CPR, then brings him to the hospital where he is resuscitated. Elsewhere, Flint Marco runs from the police and accidentally stumbles into the middle of a particle physics test. The scientists don't see him when they activate the machine and seemingly turn Flint into sand. At the hospital, Harry wakes up, though he suffered memory loss. He remembers that his father died, but not that Spider-Man killed him, or that his friend Peter is Spider-Man. At the particle test site, Flint wakes up as living sand and rearranges himself roughly into the shape of a human, though he quickly gains more control over his power and soon looks just like the old Flint. 
Later, MJ visits Peter, upset over critics bashing her recent performance in a play. He tries to lend a sympathetic ear, but is called away by Spider-Man duties. She understands, but is frustrated. Spider-Man arrives at the scene where a construction accident nearly kills Gwen Stacy, daughter of police captain George Stacy. He saves the girl and then gets his picture taken by the new Daily Bugle photographer, Eddie Brock. Brock promises him he'll take way better pictures of Spider-Man than Peter Parker does. And at the Bugle, Jameson buys Brock's photo of the crane accident over Peter's. The flames of their rivalry are fanned when both ask for a staff job, rather than freelance. Jameson agrees that whoever snaps a photo of Spider-Man in the act of committing a crime will get the job. Later, with Harry's hatred forgotten, he and Peter get along. Though Harry is surprised by his quick reflexes, not yet remembering the goblin performance enhancer is coursing through his body. At the playhouse, MJ arrives for rehearsal, only to learn she's been fired after her recent drubbing by the critics. Later, she attends an event where Spider-Man will be given a key to the city as a thank you for saving the police captain's daughter. And MJ watches as Gwen thanks Spider-Man personally, kissing him while he hangs upside down in front of the crowd. After getting fired, finding her boyfriend unavailable to lend a sympathetic shoulder, and seeing her kiss recreated with another woman, she's had enough and turns to leave, but is interrupted by a cloud of flying sand. Flint Marco uses his new form to fly through the city and steal cash from an armored truck. Spider-Man goes after him, but Flint's ability to become sand and absorb Spider-Man's attacks lets him get away. Later, Peter heads to a nice restaurant where he intends on proposing to MJ. She arrives in a sullen mood, but Peter obliviously talks only about himself and how popular Spider-Man has become. Things only get worse when Gwen Stacy happens to be there and puts her hand on Peter's shoulder. After Gwen leaves, MJ finally tells him that she's upset. When you kissed her, who was kissing her? Spider-Man or Peter? Peter pitifully defends himself and she storms off. He fishes the ring out of the champagne. Later, Peter and his aunt are called into police headquarters, where they're informed that they were wrong about who killed Uncle Ben. Dennis Carradine was just an accomplice, but Flint Marco was the true killer. He confessed the crime to a cellmate before escaping prison. MJ hears about it and visits Peter to see if he's okay, but he gruffly tells her that he's fine and she leaves. Then, after hours of listening to the police radio for a sign of his uncle's killer, Peter passes out. While he's asleep, the black goo from the meteorite finds him and engulfs his body. When he wakes up, he's hanging off a building in a black Spider-Man outfit, feeling powerful. He brings a sample of the goo to his professor, Dr. Connors. He observes that it has the characteristics of a symbiote, which needs to bond to a host to survive. And once it bonds, it may be hard to unbond. Back home, Peter finally hears word of the police chasing Marco. He opens his closet and skips the red and blue outfit, picking the black one instead. At the scene of the crime, Eddie Brock shows up to take Spider-Man's picture, but Peter breaks the man's camera before leaping underground after Marco. He notices that water has an adverse effect on the Sandman, so he rips open a pipe. The flood of water turns Marco into mud and washes him into the drainage system. Returning home, Peter snaps at his landlord and realizes the symbiote may be affecting his personality. Rent! You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! So he removes the black suit before visiting Aunt May. He proudly tells her that Spider-Man killed Flint Marco last night, but he's surprised when she is only shocked and not happy to hear it, adding, Uncle Ben meant the world to us but he wouldn't want us living one second with revenge in our hearts. Later, Peter apologizes to the landlord and agonizes over what he'll say to MJ when he calls her. Meanwhile, she visits Harry, where they do this, this, and this. After the kiss, MJ apologizes and leaves. Then Harry suddenly remembers everything, including his vow for revenge against Spider-Man. His father speaks to him again and tells him to make Peter suffer, attack his heart. So, Harry pays MJ a visit and tells her that if she wants Peter to live, she'll have to do something for him. And she does. She asks Peter to meet her and tells him that she doesn't want to see him anymore. The dumbfounded Peter says they can work it out and shows her the ring, but she is steadfast and lies to him. 
I fall in love with someone else. Then leaves. Watching from a distance, Harry congratulates MJ on her performance. Then Harry meets with Peter and pretends to still have amnesia and everything is fine between them. In their conversation, Peter learns for the first time that MJ was fired from her Broadway show. He's shocked. She was fired and she told you. She didn't tell me. And Harry lies, saying he's the other guy that MJ is in love with. Peter leaves, and a waitress asks Harry how the pie is. He responds, So good. Stewing in his apartment, Peter decides to wear the symbiote, then pays Harry a visit. In the ensuing fight, Peter eventually gets the upper hand and tells Harry he's done trying to convince him that he didn't kill his father. You took him from me. He loved me, Harry says. No, Peter replies. He despised you. Harry throws a pumpkin bomb, but Peter quickly grabs it and throws it back at him. Harry is engulfed in the explosion as Peter walks off. Later, Peter finds Spider-Man's reputation in tatters after the Daily Bugle publishes photos of him stealing money. Photos forged by Eddie Brock. At the Bugle, Peter approaches Eddie, celebrating his new staff job, and shows him proof the picture is fake. Eddie begs him to keep it to himself. But Peter hands in the proof, and Eddie is fired. In the days that follow, the symbiote continues to affect Peter, driving him to more aggressive and impulsive behavior. You got any more nuts? Um, I have some nuts. I could make some. Go make me some. He brings Gwen out on a date to the jazz bar, where MJ now works as a singer and waitress. Peter joins Mary Jane on stage and dances at her then dances seductively with Gwen, though when Gwen realizes it was all to make MJ jealous, she leaves. When a bouncer tries to make Peter leave, he fights back, and when MJ gets involved, he strikes her. At the sight of her in pain caused by him, Peter snaps out of it and sees what he's becoming, and he realizes that the symbiote is causing it. Drawn by its ringing, Peter heads to a church's bell tower and tries to remove the suit but finds it stuck to him, until he strikes the bell and it seems to adversely affect the suit. Downstairs, the humbled and humiliated Eddie Brock prays for revenge against Peter. The ringing bell draws his attention, and he follows it to see Parker struggling with the black goo. With the help of the ringing bell, Peter removes it, and the symbiote finds its next host, Eddie Brock. Then, with his new powers and corrupted mind, Brock finds Flint Marco, now recovered from Spider-Man's water attack. The two agree to team up and take out Spider-Man together. Brock kidnaps Mary Jane and holds her hostage in a taxi, suspended 80 stories above the ground in a giant web. When the police try to help, the Sandman stops them. Seeing the news, Peter grabs his old red and blue costume, then visits an old friend. He asks the now-scarred Harry Osborn for help, but he refuses, so Peter goes alone. But then, Harry's butler tells him that he cleaned his father's wounds the night he died. The blade that pierced his body did come from his glider. He died by his own hand. Spider-Man arrives to free MJ, but is overpowered by the combined attacks of Sandman and Brock. And when all hope is nearly lost, Harry Osborn arrives to help, and the two friends finally unite. Harry is able to take down the Sandman, but Peter loses the upper hand against Brock, until pipes fall, and the sound affects the black goo. Peter remembers the bell had a similar effect, and finally realizes how to remove the suit from Brock. But before he can act, Brock gets a hold of the glider and dives at Peter with its blades drawn. At the last moment, Harry leaps in its path. The blades stab through him and he saves Peter's life. Brock tosses Osborne away like a ragdoll. Then Peter uses the pipes to make more sound, and removes Brock from the suit. As the black goo grows dangerously, Peter throws one of Harry's bombs at it, and desperately wanting to hold on to his power, Brock jumps after it. When the explosion fades, he and the suit are gone. Flint Marco approaches Peter and tells him how he didn't want any of this. His daughter is dying, and he needed the money. Killing his uncle was an accident, a slip of the trigger finger when his partner ran over. Peter forgives him, and Marco blows away as sand in the wind. Then he runs to Harry, who is being cradled in MJ's arms. Peter and Harry call each other friend. Then Harry dies, killed by the blades of his glider, just like his father. Some time after the funeral, Peter visits MJ at the jazz club. They embrace, and they share a dance.
In Another World, a young Peter Parker finds his father's study ransacked. When his father, Richard, sees the mess, he quickly springs to action, erasing notes and hiding research involving spiders. Peter is taken to his Uncle Ben and Aunt May's house. Then his parents say goodbye and leave him. Years later, Peter attends high school. He enjoys skateboarding and taking pictures for the school paper. He also likes standing up for kids getting bullied, even if it means taking a few punches himself. When he stands up to Flash Thompson, Gwen Stacy takes notice and tells him it was stupid, but great. Back home that night, in the basement, Peter finds an old briefcase that belonged to his father. Inside it, Peter finds a photo of his father with Dr. Kurt Connors, both of them scientists. Searching for Kurt Connors online, Peter comes across an article about the plane crash that killed his parents. And he finds articles about Connors' research into cross-species genetics, something Connors believes could lead to a world of equality without weakness. The next day, Peter visits the place where Connors' research is being done, Oscorp. He gets in by posing as an intern and is surprised to find Gwen Stacy there. As the head intern, she gives the tour while Peter tries to avoid notice. Then they meet Dr. Kurt Connors. He tells them about his hopes to regrow his missing arm and asks the students how it can be done. Peter gives the correct answer, cross-species genetics and using various species' regenerative abilities. When Connors leaves, Gwen accuses Peter of following her, but he claims to just be there because he loves science. Then he sneaks away from the tour group. He finds a room with a symbol on it, which he recognizes from his father's notes. He breaks into the room and finds strange experiments being performed, involving spiders. Elsewhere, Dr. Rotha pressures Connors to speed up his research. Norman Osborne is dying and needs the regenerative abilities that Connors is after. Connors explains that he just needs to figure out how to get past the decay rate algorithm, something mentioned in Richard Parker's notes. Peter returns to the tour group along with one of the spiders unnoticed on his neck. It proceeds to bite him. On the subway ride home, Peter finds that he's suddenly strong, fast, and has the ability to stick to walls. The next day, he pays Connors a visit. The scientist almost closes the door on him until Peter mentions he's the son of Richard Parker. Connors doesn't know why Richard disappeared, but without him and his research, their hopes for achieving cross-species genetics have become far slimmer, especially considering the decay rate algorithm. But Peter takes out a notebook and shows a formula he grabbed from his father's notes. Connors is amazed and invites Peter to join him in the lab. At school, Peter uses his new strength and reflexes to humiliate Flash Thompson, then gets a talking to from Uncle Ben. Thanks to Peter's misbehavior, Ben had to change shifts at work, so Peter will have to be the one to pick up Aunt May later. Then Peter awkwardly asks out Gwen Stacy, but she says yes, and he celebrates by using his spider skills to take his skateboarding to the next level. At the lab, Connors shows Peter the Ganali device a machine that could disperse an antigen over an entire city, to cure a disease for example. Then they run a simulation to see if lizard DNA can be used to regrow a mouse's missing limb. With Peter's help, it's a success. So they inject a three-legged mouse with the real thing. Back home, Uncle Ben reminds Peter that he forgot to pick up his aunt and orders him to apologize. Then he chastises him further telling him the principle that his father lived by. If you could do something good for other people, you have a moral obligation to do it. Not choice, he says, responsibility. And Peter responds, he didn't think it was his responsibility to be here to tell me this himself. Then Peter storms out of the house, inadvertently shattering the glass on the front door. Uncle Ben heads out to look for him, while Peter stops at a convenience store for chocolate milk but he's two cents short. Then a thief robs the cash register and tosses Peter the milk. The store employee shouts for someone to stop the thief, but Peter refuses. Then the criminal Peter let go bumps into Uncle Ben and inadvertently shoots him. Peter runs over and watches his uncle die. In the following days, Peter grieves by walking the streets, beating criminals, and searching for his uncle's killer. 
When one of his victims promises revenge and says that he'll remember Peter's face, he has the idea to wear a mask. So the next time he chases criminals, Peter wears a red ski mask. He also looks into Oscorp's research on biocables and uses it to create web shooters, allowing him to swing through the city. Soon, the city becomes aware of the web-slinging vigilante, and so does Gwen Stacy's father, police captain George Stacy. And Peter continues to upgrade his costume until he finally becomes Spider-Man. He easily captures petty criminals and learns to evade the police, who don't seem to appreciate his unsolicited help. At Oscorp, Dr. Rotha sees the mouse's regrown limb and pushes for Connors to begin human trials. Norman Osborne will die without the gene therapy. But Connors refuses, as they need to run more tests first. So Rotha fires him. Connors realizes that will mean losing the chance to use the drug himself and regrow his missing arm. So before vacating the lab, he takes the injection. Later, he wakes up with a new arm but begins to suffer side effects. Scales spread on his body as he begins to transform into a man-sized lizard. Meanwhile, Gwen invites Peter to dinner at her house. That night, he meets her father and listens to his diatribe against the new spider vigilante. The supposed hero recently apprehended a car thief, who the police were following in the hopes that he'd lead them to the people who run the whole operation. Thanks to Spider-Man, their six-month-long sting was a waste. Peter defends the hero, while George is adamant he should leave the job for the police. Outside, Peter confesses to Gwen that he is the web-slinging vigilante, and they kiss. Gwen is called inside, and sirens call Peter's attention. Following the chaos, he finds a humanoid lizard on the Williamsburg Bridge, searching for Dr. Rotha. The lizard throws Dr. Rotha's car off the bridge, but Peter catches it just in time. The villain takes off, and rather than pursue him, Peter stays behind to help civilians, rescuing a child from a burning vehicle. The next day, George Stacy publicly issues an arrest warrant for the one man they can positively place at the prior night's crime scene, Spider-Man. At the lab, Peter finds Dr. Connors acting strangely, and sees their lab mouse has turned into a part lizard cannibal. He tries telling Captain Stacy that Connors turned himself into a giant lizard, but he's met with skepticism. Later, Peter sees an ad in the Daily Bugle offering money for pictures of the lizard. Then, Peter spots lizards conspicuously crawling into a storm drain. So, he heads underground to investigate and finds the lizard, plus snaps a few photos of him. The lizard tells Spider-Man that he can feel himself growing stronger every day and slashes Spider-Man across the chest. They fight through the sewers until Peter escapes, though he leaves his camera behind, and on it, the lizard spots the property of Peter Parker sticker. Peter heads to Gwen's place and she tends to his wounds, and when they kiss, she hesitates. She already worries about her father every time he leaves the house to fight crime. She doesn't know if she can take worrying about Peter the same way, but he insists that he has to stop the lizard. After all, he's the one who handed over the formula that made his transformation possible. Then, he takes Gwen for a swing on his web. While underground, Connors returns to human form but begins to go mad. He injects himself again and vows that Parker will not get in the way of his plans. He heads to Peter's school, and the two fight in the halls and classrooms. Peter changes to his Spider-Man outfit, while the lizard rants about how he can cure everyone, the same way he cured himself. When the police arrive, the lizard escapes back the way he came, through the pipes, and Peter goes after him in the sewers. Peter speaks to Gwen on the phone and tells her to head back to Oscorp and generate a serum they'll need. Then, he finds Connor's underground lab and watches a recording of the madman. Connors lays out his plan to disperse the gene-altering substance across the city to convert the citizens into lizard people, more powerful than weak humans. And he plans to spread the substance from Oscorp Tower using the Ganali device. When the police attack the lizard, their squad becomes the first subjects of his citywide experiment. Peter calls Gwen and tells her to get out of Oscorp, the lizard is on his way. She tells him the antidote just needs eight more minutes, and she'll stay to help everyone get out. He tries to stop her, but it's no use. As Spider-Man swings toward Oscorp, the police manage to corner him, 
and George Stacy learns his identity. It's headed to Oscorp, Peter warns, and your daughter's there right now. George lets him go, but an overzealous officer shoots Peter in the leg. Despite the wound, he continues toward Oscorp. With one minute to go for the antidote, Lizard breaks into the lab. Across the city, a wounded Spider-Man struggles to make it in time. Then, the father of the boy he saved on the bridge sees his struggle on the news. Working in construction, he calls his friends and has cranes lined up in a series toward Oscorp, giving Spider-Man an easy, swingable path. On the ground, Gwen gets out of the building with the antidote and runs into her father. She tells him that she needs to get the serum to Spider-Man, but unwilling to let his daughter take that risk, George grabs the antidote and heads in himself. Atop the building, Peter tries to stop the lizard from activating the Ganali device. In their fight, Connors overpowers Peter and destroys his web shooters. But George Stacy rescues him at the last moment. He hands Peter the antidote while he takes care of Lizard, with help from his shotgun and some liquid nitrogen. But soon, the Lizard regenerates too quickly and mortally wounds Captain George Stacy, then goes after Spider-Man, but not before Peter manages to swap the Lizard serum for the antidote. The device activates and releases a cloud of the antidote, turning Connors and his other victims human again. Peter nearly tumbles off the building, but Connors catches him, and Peter runs to George. With his dying breaths, Stacy admits he was wrong. The city does need Spider-Man, but he just wants Peter to make one promise. Spider-Man is going to make enemies. It's going to be dangerous for anyone to be close to him. So, he tells Peter to stay away from Gwen. Peter agrees, and George dies. Dr. Connors is arrested, and in the days that follow, Peter stays away from Gwen, even at her father's funeral. Then, one rainy day, she demands to know where he's been, and Peter tells her that he can't see her, but she realizes that must be because her father made him promise he'd stay away, to keep her safe. She leaves. But Peter misses her. When he's late to class one day, he promises he won't be tardy again. The teacher tells him not to make promises he can't keep, and Peter whispers to Gwen, Yeah, but those are the best kind. And she smiles. In the past, Richard and Mary Parker abandon their son and fly off to keep him safe. While aboard the plane, they upload important files. But they find an assassin has infiltrated their flight, and in the ensuing struggle, the plane crashes. Two years after Captain Stacy's death, Spider-Man pursues Alexei Sitsevich, currently attempting to steal a truck full of plutonium. In the chaos, hapless electrical engineer Max Dillon is nearly struck by an airborne taxi, but Spider-Man saves his life. Max is enthralled by the hero. As Spider-Man safely procures the plutonium, Gwen calls him from the high school graduation he's currently missing. As they talk, Peter is haunted by the vision of her father, to whom he promised he'd stay away from Gwen. Peter takes down the bad guy, while Gwen gives her graduation speech about how short life is, and how you have to fight for what matters most to you. Peter rushes over and makes it just as his name is called, and before leaving the stage, he passionately kisses Gwen. After the graduation, Peter can't stop himself thinking about her father and their promise. And at dinner, he can't bring himself to join Gwen and her family. She can tell exactly what's wrong. She assures him that it's her choice to be with him and take the risk. It's not her father's decision. But Peter can't live with himself knowing he might bring her harm. So they end things. In the days that follow, Spider-Man continues to help those in need. And Max Dillon's obsession with the hero grows, regularly speaking to a photo of Spider-Man, calling him best friend. On his way into Oscorp, he bumps into Gwen. On the elevator ride, he enviously watches a news report about Spider-Man and pines for similar adoration from the public. And he tells Gwen about the time he was saved. You know, Spider-Man saved my life one time. Out of all the people in the whole city, he saved me. At the end of their ride, he's shocked the girl remembered his name. Remember my name. At the Osborne home, Harry speaks to his ill father, Norman. The man accuses his son of throwing away his intelligence and potential, then reminds him that the disease is genetic, and asks to see Harry's shaking hand. 
the early signs of the retroviral hyperplasia, which will eventually kill him, too. He hands Harry a small device containing his life's work, everything that's kept him alive, and adds, Maybe you can succeed where I failed. The next day, Peter sees a news report announcing Norman Osborn's death, and that his son Harry will inherit the Oscorp Empire. At Oscorp, employees leave for the day, but Max is forced to stay late and look into a current flow problem in the genomics lab, on Max's birthday of all days. In the lab, as Max works on the issue, something goes wrong. He is electrocuted and falls into a vat of eels. After Harry's first board meeting as the new head of Oscorp, he's visited by a friend he has not seen in eight years, Peter Parker. Their reunion is awkward at first, but they're soon laughing again. You got your braces on. Now there's nothing to distract from your unibrow. There he is. There he is. Then they catch up on things by the East River, about the supermodels Harry hung out with in France, and Peter's current love life. I don't know, it's uh, I don't know, it's complicated. Elsewhere, the seemingly dead Max Dillon springs to life, though he now appears to be a being made of electricity. As he walks the streets, he inadvertently emits an electric signal, setting off car alarms. And when he places his hand on a headlight, he absorbs its energy. Later, Gwen calls Peter and asks him to meet, figuring it's time they try to be friends. But it's hard for them to forget how much they like each other. They nearly kiss, but Gwen stops it with the admission that she's moving to England. She's up for a scholarship at Oxford, and she's probably going to get it. Before they can discuss further, they notice a strange disturbance at Times Square. So Peter changes to Spider-Man and leaves. At Times Square, Max is drawn to underground power cables. He grabs them and absorbs their power. Then, as a truck nearly strikes him, he uses that power to easily lift it and toss it aside. Police surround him, and Max panics like a caged animal. Suddenly, he lets out an electric blast that sends the police and their vehicles flying. Spider-Man catches one just before it crushes an officer. The rest of the cops fire at Max, but the bullets just pass through. Spider-Man tries talking to him, and the police hold their fire. After Max reminds him, Peter remembers the man and remembers saving him. Max tells Peter that he's not sure what's going on, but he can feel power and anger. Peter tries to keep him talking and suggests they go somewhere else, away from people. But when Max accidentally releases more electricity, a cop fires and he strikes back. A cop is nearly killed by debris, but Peter saves him and the crowd applauds, while they only mock Max. Feeling betrayed by Spider-Man, he sends an electric shock at him, and the two fight. While Spider-Man is incapacitated, Max absorbs more electricity, shutting down Times Square and filling himself with more power. Floating above them, he attacks the crowd of bystanders, until Spider-Man takes him out with a stream of water from a fire hose. Later, Peter wallows in self-pity at losing Gwen, then channels his frustration by manically continuing his search into why his parents disappeared. Meanwhile, Harry looks at the files on the device his father left him. After researching all night, he calls Peter over. Harry explains how his and Peter's fathers worked on a project focused on human-spider hybrids. Venom from the hybrids could be extracted and would have powerful healing properties. Harry tells Peter that he's dying of a disease, and this venom is his only hope at a cure, but they never got to human trials, except for Spider-Man. Harry surmises that Spider-Man must have been bitten by one of the spiders, and it worked. That's how he got his powers. He needs Spider-Man's blood. But Peter reminds him it's not that simple. Look at what happened to Connors. But Harry doesn't care. Peter took Spider-Man's picture and clearly knows him. He demands Peter tell him where he can find Spider-Man. And when Peter hesitates, Harry begs. So Peter agrees to try talking to Spider-Man. Meanwhile, Gwen tries to search for Max Dillon in the Oscorp database. And when the higher-ups detect her search, they pursue her, wanting to ensure the accident is covered up. She runs and bumps into Peter. She pulls him into a closet and tells him about the accident, and how they erased all the files to cover it up. Then, being close gets the better of them, and they kiss. On her way out, Gwen meets Peter's old friend Harry, 
and Harry learns that she's the girl Peter has his complicated relationship with. At Ravencroft Institute, Dr. Kafka studies a restrained Max Dillon on Oscorp's behalf, but Max warns that he can feel the electricity around him and is more powerful than they know. He declares himself Electro and vows to show everyone how it feels to live in his world, a dark world without mercy and without Spider-Man. Electro lets out a small blast that breaks Kafka's glasses. Then they submerge the villain in water as he struggles against his restraints. At home, Peter begs Aunt May to tell him the truth about his father. He can tell she's hiding something, and she finally tells him what it is. After Richard Parker died, government men visited Ben and May's home. The men told them that Richard ran off because his and Osborne's research was so valuable. Richard betrayed his friend for money, to sell the research. Peter doesn't believe it. Later, he visits Harry as Spider-Man and tells him that he can't give his blood. It's too dangerous. Harry retorts that he's dying anyway, but Spider-Man points out it could do something worse than kill him. They argue and Spider-Man leaves. As Peter, he approaches Gwen, who is already late for her final interview with Oxford, but he begs her to listen. Everything he knows about his parents is a lie. He doesn't know what to do about Harry. His life is falling apart but he keeps coming back to one thing. Before he can say what that one thing is, Gwen tells him that she has to go to England. Maybe they're just on different paths right now. Peter wishes her luck and she heads up for the interview. Back home, Peter continues going through his father's things and discovers a connection to Roosevelt Station, a once hidden and now abandoned subway station. At Oscorp Tower, Harry speaks to his assistant, Felicia Hardy, and bemoans how Oscorp destroyed all the genetically engineered spiders after the lizard incident. But she tells him that she overheard they extracted the venom first, keeping it somewhere called Special Projects. But before Harry can dig any further, he's fired as CEO. The board covered up Max's accident and reported that he's dead but they pinned the cover up on Harry and forced him to take the fall. Meanwhile, Peter takes a coin he found in his father's things, and when he uses it at the secret station, a hidden subway car appears. In it, Peter finds a recording left by his father. His father explains that Norman Osborn made a deal with a foreign military to fund their research. When Richard found out they were going to use the research for biological weapons, he ran and took the research with him. He adds that the DNA placed in the spiders was his own, so they are only compatible with him or his bloodline, meaning Osborne cannot continue the research without him. At Ravencroft, Harry sneaks in to see Electro. They quickly make a deal. Harry will get Electro out if Electro can get Harry into Oscorp, so he can get the venom. Leaving the subway station, Peter receives a voicemail from Gwen. She got into Oxford and is on her way to the airport now. With Electro's help, Harry gets back into Oscorp. He heads to special projects, while Electro heads into the electrical grid to get even more power. In special projects, Harry forces one of the board members to inject him with the venom. The effect is immediate. Harry writhes in pain as his muscles and skin mutate. Then, he puts on an armored suit with healing properties that stabilizes him. The suit also comes with a glider. On her way to the airport, Gwen spots a crowd looking at Spider-Man, and she sees he webbed up a message for her on the bridge. I love you. Then, he grabs her and tells her that she was wrong. They are not on different paths. She is his path. He'll follow her to England and wherever else she goes. As they kiss, the entire city's power goes out thanks to Electro's meddling. Spider-Man goes after Electro, and Gwen insists on going too. From her work at Oscorp, she knows the power grid, and Peter will need her help. But Peter webs her to a car and leaves. He finds Electro at the power grid, and they fight, while Gwen quickly frees herself. Electro gets the upper hand and nearly defeats Spider-Man, until Gwen crashes a police car into the villain. Peter is horrified she's there. You can't be here right now. I'm not messing around. You can't be- But she insists on staying. So, they decide on a plan of attack. They need to overpower Electro, so he'll explode like a battery. Peter will reconnect the power lines, and when he says to, Gwen will turn the power on. The plan works. Electro is gone, and power to the city is restored. But as Peter and Gwen reconvene, they hear laughter. Harry Osborn, twisted by the venom, 
appears on his glider. Seeing Gwen, he quickly realizes that Spider-Man is Peter and accuses him of betrayal. Then he decides to take revenge. The Green Goblin takes Gwen into the air and drops her. Peter catches her, but they crash into a clock tower. Peter puts her down to fight off the goblin's attacks, and in the struggle, the clock's mechanism is destroyed. Debris knocks the goblin out and severs the web holding Gwen. She falls, and Peter's web chases after her. It reaches Gwen, but can't save her. Peter leaps to the bottom of the tower and cradles her lifeless body. <laughs> no, please, please. After the funeral, Peter visits her grave often. At Ravencroft, a mysterious gentleman visits Harry Osborne and tells him that he's found several promising candidates. Osborne says he wants to keep the team small and assures the gentleman that everything they need is at Oscorp. There, he selects an armored rhino suit for their first volunteer, Alexei Sitovich. Later, the news reports on the Russian gangster's escape from prison. It's just one more sign of the increased crime since Spider-Man's disappearance five months ago. Peter watches a recording of Gwen's graduation speech, where she talks about hope and how it is most needed on dark days. Peter puts on his suit and fights the rhino. In another universe, or possibly the same one, the jury is still out. Eddie Brock, no, not that one, that's better. Eddie Brock is a successful investigative journalist with his own show and a fiancé he loves, lawyer Ann Weying. But all this is about to change. Eddie's boss assigns him an exclusive interview with entrepreneur Carlton Drake. Eddie is eager to confront Drake based on the hunch that he's a crook. The boss warns against this and orders Eddie to play nice. That night, while Ann sleeps, Eddie heads to the kitchen for a drink when he notices an email notification on her laptop, a case briefing involving the Life Foundation, Drake's company, a case of wrongful deaths. Armed with this new information, Eddie confronts Drake at the interview, accusing him of recruiting the most vulnerable among us for dangerous tests. For disobeying orders, Eddie is fired, and because he used confidential information taken from Anne, so is she. Eddie loses everything that day, his job and his fiance, who leaves him for his betrayal. Six months later, Eddie struggles to find work thanks to his tarnished reputation. His only solace are two friends at his favorite convenience store, the owner, Miss Chen, and the homeless woman who sleeps outside it, Maria. After a thug demands protection money from Miss Chen at gunpoint, while Eddie cowers, she commiserates with him. Life hurts, Eddie, she says. It just does. But soon, Eddie is given an opportunity to prove otherwise, to rediscover meaning in his life. He's approached by Dora Skirth, a scientist who works under Carlton Drake, a scientist who heard Eddie's accusations months earlier and knows they are true. And lately, things have only gotten worse. Drake has filled his lab with poor people, signing waivers they don't understand, for experiments that more often than not turn deadly. Eddie resists at first, and he visits Anne, who he's dismayed to find has moved on. She's with Dan now, a surgeon. Eddie contemplates his life. It seems he has two choices, continue to do nothing, or do something that matters. He chooses the latter. Skirth sneaks him into the Life Foundation and explains what Drake is up to. Drake believes that climate change and overpopulation will soon make Earth uninhabitable, so he's been sending ships into space to seek alternatives. One recon ship found a comet teeming with millions of organisms. They brought back four of them and learned that they are symbiotes, only capable of surviving in our environment by bonding with a host. And just as bonding with humans would allow them to survive on Earth, it would also allow humans to survive in space. So Drake has been experimenting, trying to bond humans with symbiotes, but thus far, every attempt has killed the person. Their bodies reject the symbiote like a body rejecting an organ transplant. Symbiosis requires the perfect match. Inside the lab, Eddie finds one dead symbiote, the result of a failed experiment, and one living, 
Inside his friend, Maria, he frees her from the cell, but he's too late. She fails to achieve symbiosis. Eddie's friend dies, and the symbiote chooses him as its next host. As Drake's guards come for him, the symbiote grants Eddie strength, speed, and agility, and maneuvers his body like a puppet to escape capture. Back home, Eddie finds himself with an insatiable appetite, and hears a deep, growling voice in his head, which simply says, Eddie. In a panic, he looks for Anne, interrupting a date with Dan. He brings Eddie to the hospital for an MRI. The scan is painful for the symbiote, who is sensitive to its sound waves. But for now, at least, Eddie seems to have calmed down. But later, the voice returns, this time demanding that it's hungry, and he's in luck, because some delicious snacks arrive, in the form of Drake's men. By interrogating Skirth, Drake learned that Eddie Brock has his symbiote. While Drake's men come for him, Skirth is punished for her betrayal, becoming the latest test subject for human symbiote bonding, a test which will kill both her and the symbiote. Surrounded by men with guns, Eddie quickly puts his hands up in surrender, but the symbiote pulls them back down. You're making us look bad, he chides his host, then once again takes the wheel. The symbiote once again uses its great power to escape, but this time also reveals gooey black tendrils which make for a powerful weapon and defense mechanism. When Eddie is wounded in the battle, the symbiote takes over completely, subsuming Eddie into its dark, hulking form. The monster looks at one of the bad guys and prepares to finally satiate his hunger. Eyes, lungs, pancreas. So many snacks, so little time. He slobbers, giving someone else a chance to shoot him in the back, which turns out to be a grave error. The symbiote bites his head off, flees to safety, and returns to human form. Eddie is relieved to find the transformation healed his wounds, and he finally meets his parasite face to face. I am Venom. It introduces itself, and explains that to him, Eddie is merely a vessel, something he needs to survive so he can make his way back to the Life Foundation and take Carlton Drake's rocket, though he doesn't yet tell Eddie why. The truth Venom keeps to himself is that his orders are to use Drake's ship to reach the others of his kind in return with an invasion force to take Earth. But his feelings on the matter are beginning to change. Eddie heads to his boss's office to leave evidence of Drake's wrongdoings. Venom helps him to the top of the building so he can reach the office, and from their perch, Venom admires the view. Your world is not so ugly after all. I'm almost sorry to see it end, he says. Before Eddie can react, a low-flying plane passes over, and its sound waves are just as harmful as the MRI. It knocks them off the building, but Venom saves them. Eddie leaves the evidence, then finds a SWAT team waiting for him downstairs. Venom makes short work of them, though Eddie stops him from using lethal force. Outside, they find Anne, who tells Eddie they have to go to the hospital. She gives him a ride and explains he needs another MRI. No, Venom insists. Sound waves are like his kryptonite. Sound waves and fire. In a quiet moment, Venom, with access to Eddie's thoughts and memories, feels his sadness and reminds him he never apologized to Anne and may not get another chance. So, Eddie apologizes. At the hospital, Dan explains that Eddie's parasite is killing him, eating his organs from the inside. Venom is offended at the term and insists he can heal Eddie. But when he feels cornered, he lashes out in defense. Anne quickly blasts him with MRI sound waves, separating the symbiote from its host. Eddie leaves while Venom escapes through a vent. Without Venom's help, Eddie is immediately recaptured and interrogated by Drake and by Drake's symbiote. Something Skirth didn't mention to Eddie is that when Drake's ship returned six months ago, it crashed and one of the four specimens escaped. By hopping from one host to another, it slowly made its way back to the Life Foundation and taken Drake as a host. Now, it wants to know where to find Venom. Eddie gives them nothing, so Drake's men take him out to the woods for execution. But before they finish the job, they're attacked by black tendrils. It seems that without Eddie, Venom had to improvise and found another host. 
Anne. With a sloppy kiss, Venom returns to Eddie and urges that they have to move quickly. Drake's symbiote is named Riot, and he's their team leader. If they don't stop him, he'll take Drake's ship to space and come back with an invasion force. Venom was on his side, but has since changed his mind. Back on his planet, Venom was a loser like Eddie. But here, he says, we could be more. Eddie asks him what really made him change his mind, and Venom admits, you. You did, Eddie. Now officially working together, in perfect symbiosis, they head to Drake's lab for a face-off with Riot, a stronger symbiote with a powerful arsenal, and just as Venom expected, their battle is decidedly one-sided. Eddie and Venom do their best, but soon, Riot absorbs them both. But they have help. Anne blasts them with noise, and the sound waves separate the four organisms. Riot quickly regains the upper hand, recombining with Drake and fatally stabbing Eddie with a sharp creation from his own body. Riot boards the ship and takes off. While Venom finds his host and now friend bleeding out, he quickly recombines with Eddie, healing his wounds, then removes the sharp piece of Riot and uses it to destroy the ship. The explosion kills Riot, Drake, and seemingly Venom too, while Eddie falls safely to the waters below. In the coming days, however, a familiar voice in Eddie's head assures him that Venom is alive and well, something he tries to keep from Anne, though she's quickly suspicious. As Eddie returns to his favorite convenience store, he and Venom go over the rules. Only eat bad people. And thankfully, they find one pointing a gun at Miss Chen, demanding protection money. This time, instead of cowering, Eddie invites Venom to enjoy a snack. And later, Eddie gets another exclusive interview, this time with serial killer Cletus Cassidy. He asked for Eddie by name, and hoping he'd reveal where some of the bodies are buried, the FBI obliged. Cletus reveals nothing in the interview, but Eddie gets another chance one year later, when Detective Patrick Mulligan summons him for another interview. This time, Cletus makes a deal. Print my message in the papers, and I'll tell you my life story. The message? That distant cathedral is all I see. A fractured angel, the other part of me. Eddie obliges, and on the way out, Venom notices drawings on Cletus's cell walls. Venom commits them to memory, and once they return home, draws them out on paper. He recognizes one of them as a sketch of hills in Rodeo Beach, California, which turns out to be the location where Cletus buried his many victims' bodies. Cracking the case reignites Eddie's career, and public outrage against Cletus. Bowing to that outrage, the governor overturns his moratorium and reinstates the death penalty. But while Eddie is back on top of his career, his relationship is another story. Venom is hungry and sick of hiding behind Eddie. He needs to be free, to feel the wind in his hair and sand between his toes. But most of all, He's hungry. He doesn't want to live on chicken and chocolate anymore. He wants to eat bad guys. They find a mugger, but at Eddie's pestering, Venom acquiesces and lets the bad guy go. Though disappointed, the symbiote is quickly uplifted by some good news, a call from Anne. She has news to share with Eddie and wants to meet in person. That is the voice of a woman who just got brutally dumped. Venom announces. They arrive at the dinner expecting an opportunity to win her back, but instead find an engagement ring on her finger. She and Dan are engaged. On the drive home, Eddie is reckless. Venom asks him to slow down, but Eddie won't hear it. Why? He shouts. You don't believe in consequences. No injuries. You fix them. No hangovers. You mend them. I couldn't even hurt myself if I tried. Venom pulls him over and apologizes that he can't mend the heart, but reassures him, Don't worry, buddy. I will get you through this. The next morning, he makes good on his promise with a messy breakfast and even grabs the mail for Eddie, which contains an invitation from Cletus to his execution, along with a quickly scribbled autobiography about how he was abused as a child and retaliated, pushing his grandma down the stairs and tossing a hairdryer in his mother's tub. After that, his dad beat him to the brink of death and sent him to St. Estes' home for unwanted children, 
a circus of hell, except for one bright light. Eddie accepts the invitation, despite Venom's protest against it, and Venom turns out to be right. At his final visit with the condemned, Eddie takes a verbal assault from Cletus. You are a cancer to everyone who ever loved you, Eddie, deceived your trusting fiance, and no wonder daddy could never look at you again after you killed his wife, your mother, just by being born. It's a low blow, too low for Venom to abide, especially when it's his friend and host in the crosshairs. The symbiote attacks, which gets them close to Cletus, close enough for the killer to take a bite of Eddie's hand and get a taste of his blood, blood he quickly recognizes as inhuman. Eddie returns home, furious with Venom for his actions. Ever since the symbiote came into his life, he hasn't known a second of peace and quiet. Venom is quick to point out the good he's brought too, like the recent revival of Eddie's career. The argument devolves into a fight, and the fight devolves into a breakup. Venom leaves his host, and Eddie finally knows peace. Until he sees the news. The execution failed. The electricity awoke a symbiote in Cletus, born of the blood he drank from Eddie and Venom. Then, the serial killer turned alien hybrid made a slaughterhouse of the prison. Detective Mulligan visits Eddie, but finds no answers. Eddie goes in search of his own, by visiting St. Estes, where he finds a carving in a tree. C.K. loves F.B. He calls Patrick, and the detective immediately knows who F.B. is. Francis Barrison, Cletus Cassidy's one bright light at that circus of hell, a girl with a special ability to produce deadly sound waves by shrieking, an ability she used to protect Cletus from other kids, until her ability grew too powerful and she was taken to another facility, Ravencroft. Patrick himself watched over her during the transfer, but it didn't go well. She shrieked, and he shot her. He thought he killed her, but all he did was cost her an eye. She still lives today at Ravencroft. By the time Patrick gets there, Cletus has already broken her out, with help from his new red friend, Carnage. Furious at the constant loose ends, the detective brings Eddie in for questioning. So Eddie calls his lawyer. Anne. He asks her to find Venom for him, so she pays a visit to Miss Chen, who quickly reveals she has become Venom's new host. The symbiote is at first uninterested in helping, but after Anne strokes his ego and promises an apology from Eddie, he relents. In truth, he misses Eddie. Since leaving him, Venom has been eager to prove he doesn't need him, but he quickly found that all the parties and glow sticks in the world can't fill the Eddie Brock-sized hole in his heart. He bonds with Anne and breaks Eddie out of holding. Once Eddie apologizes, begs, and apologizes some more, Venom takes him back. Meanwhile, Cletus and company plan a red wedding where each of them will enjoy a sacrifice. For Francis, the cop who took her eye. For Cletus, Eddie Brock. And for Carnage, his father, Venom. Eating him will make the symbiote even more powerful. They quickly collect their unwilling guests. Carnage grabs Detective Patrick Mulligan, while Francis grabs Anne as bait to lure her prey. Anne leaves Dan with a message for Eddie. Come to our wedding at Grace Cathedral, or Anne dies. Of course they come, but Venom quickly insists they retreat. Once he sees that Cletus's symbiote is a red one, but Eddie makes a deal. If Venom stays to fight, he can eat everyone. Time to die, Venom announces. That's the spirit, Eddie replies. I mean us, Venom explains. We are going to die. Carnage proves just as dangerous as Venom feared. They get some help from Dan, armed with fire and gasoline, but it's not enough to turn the tide. Venom and Eddie soon find themselves trapped by debris. Patrick is incapacitated, and Carnage brings Anne to the top of the cathedral for execution. But for Francis, killing Anne is over the line. She begs him to stop, so Carnage shuts her up. That doesn't sit well with Cletus, and the two begin to fight, threatening to tear the symbiote from its host. They're not symbiotic, Eddie observes. They're not a match. We are, Venom echoes. That's right, Eddie responds. We are. Uplifted, Venom shouts, Together, we are! 
he lifts the debris, and in unison they announce, The Lethal Protector. They rush for another bout with Carnage at the top of the cathedral. They save Anne, but take a beating from the red monster. They'll be killed unless they make some noise. Venom throws Francis into the church bell, and as she careens toward death, she shrieks. The symbiotes are separated from their hosts, and the building collapses. Venom manages to catch Eddie just before he lands. But Cletus isn't so lucky. He lands hard. The symbiote crawls toward him, but Venom rips the red goo off the floor and eats it. Then Cletus offers some last words, before Venom decides, f*** this guy, and eats his head. Before the authorities arrive, Anne warns they'll come for Eddie and Venom. They wish her and Dan well, then go on the run together, as the lethal protector. And atop the cathedral, Patrick Mulligan's eyes glow blue as he whispers, Monsters. Later, Eddie and Venom visit a beach, where although the symbiote can't feel the wind in his hair, he can at least feel the sand in his toes. And while the alien takes a vacation, a vampire is born in Manhattan. Dr. Michael Morbius suffers a rare blood disease, but hasn't let it slow him down. By age 35, he is offered the Nobel Prize for developing synthetic blood an offer he turns down. His interest is singular, find a cure before the disease kills him and his best friend Milo. They met at the children's hospital 25 years ago. The 10-year-old Michael had been there as long as he could remember, and he shared the room with a boy named Milo. But the hospital was not a place where roommates lasted very long, and Milo was soon replaced by another boy. In a sort of gallows humor, Michael deemed him new Milo, same with the next boy, and the next, and so on. When Lucian was admitted, Michael gave him the same treatment, calling him Milo. But this time, it wouldn't be Milo who left, but Michael himself. The hospital director, Nicholas, recognized the boy's immense talent and intellect, something he was not equipped to properly foster, so he sent Michael to a school for gifted children in New York. He completed his doctorate at 19 and became the leading authority on bloodborne diseases. Milo has also been successful, enough to amass a fortune which he uses to support Michael in his search for a cure, a search which has become desperate because the disease will soon take them both. Michael's colleague and romantic partner Martine Bancroft learns just how desperate he's become when she discovers that he's been experimenting on vampire bats. In order to drink blood, they produce unique anticoagulants which could save him. From the bats, he creates a serum. After 116 trials, killing 116 mice, he finally produces a working serum. Test subject 117 lives. Test subject 118 will be Michael Morbius himself. Given the highly experimental and illegal nature of the procedure, Milo charters Michael a ship in international waters. Michael and Martine will complete the experiment while guarded by eight mercenaries, none of whom survive the voyage, because while the serum does save Michael's life, it also turns him into a vampiric monster. With super strength and speed, the monster easily evades gunfire and drains all eight men of their blood. Only after the slaughter does Michael's body and mind return to human form. He's horrified by what he's done, but relieved to find Martine is alive. He calls for emergency services, then leaves the ship on his own. Michael returns to his lab, where already his urge to consume human blood is overwhelming. For now, he satiates it with blue, synthetic blood, and with a clear mind, he gets to know his new self. For the first time in his entire life, he feels good. In addition to superhuman speed and strength, he also possesses advanced echolocation, and his vampire bats now see him not as food, but as one of their own. On the other hand, he needs to consume blood or risk turning feral again, and the blue blood will only take him so far, eventually it won't be enough. He'll need some true red blood. Milo visits him at the lab and witnesses his desperation for blood firsthand, but that is a minor detail next to the bigger truth. Michael has cured himself. He will live, and so can Milo. Except Michael refuses to give him the serum, 
It's too dangerous. It's already turned him into a monster. Milo leaves unsatisfied and angry, because that isn't fair. Why should Michael get to live while Milo has to die? At the hospital, two FBI agents question Martine. Eight bodies on a ship with no blood and puncture marks on their neck have raised suspicion, and she is the vessel's only known survivor. Bancroft gives them nothing, but already they suspect Michael had something to do with it. Soon, he visits Martine himself, but is forced to run again when a dead nurse is found, drained of blood. Was it Michael? Did he lose control again, give in to bloodlust like he did on the ship? He blames himself, and so does the FBI. The cell holds him for a few hours, until Milo pays him a visit to drop off some red. And Michael realizes two things. Milo took the serum, and he's the one who killed that nurse. With the strength of real blood, Michael breaks out of the cell, and with echolocation, finds Milo. His friend admits he killed the nurse, but it wasn't his fault. It was just like Michael's first time. He lost control. But it's obvious Milo is different. He was always treated differently thanks to his disease. He was always looked down upon, when all he wanted was to be normal. Now he's more than normal. He's powerful, and he intends to use that power, and he won't let Michael take it away from him. He attacks his friend, and when the police spot them brawling, Milo kills them without a moment's hesitation. He dances a small jig and announces, All our lives we've lived with death hanging over us. Why? Why shouldn't they know what it feels like for a change, Michael? Michael turns away from his friend and notices the airflow produced by an incoming subway. Like a bat, he uses it to glide through the air and escape. Now he is a prime suspect for the nurse and the cops, so he is forced to be discreet, but quietly approaches Martine and asks for help. He tells her about Milo, and asks her to grab a few things from his lab. Then he acquires a new one by stealing it from a gang of counterfeiters. That night, Milo continues to explore his newfound affinity for dancing before heading out for some more feeding. He drops by the lab to look for Michael, but only finds Martine who feigns ignorance. The next day, the FBI agents find more bodies drained of blood and spot Milo in security footage. So he joins Michael as a prime suspect, and both their faces are released on the news, which catches Nicholas's attention. He visits Milo to dissuade him from committing any further violence. But the new Milo doesn't like being told what to do, and he doesn't like when it seems that someone favors Michael over him. So he shows Nicholas his primal face, then rips open his guts and tosses him across the room. At his makeshift lab, Michael develops a new serum, a poison capable of killing Milo and himself. He sees no other way to erase their dangerous bloodlust. As he leaves the lab, he gets a call from a dying Nicholas and rushes to find him. You have to stop him. Those are his last, whispered words before dying. And a few blocks away, there are a few more last words waiting for Michael. Milo sinks his teeth into Martine and leaves her for dead too. By the time Michael reaches her, Milo is gone. Make it mean something, she whispers. I can help you. Michael gives her a last kiss. She tastes a drop of his blood before he helps himself to hers. That's when Milo finds him. And now, the two vampires, surging with power after fresh meals of real blood, fight. The fight seems to tip in Milo's favor, but Michael has some allies that Milo didn't count on. Vampire bats. They swarm Milo and pin him down, giving Michael a chance to inject him with the deadly poison. The last thing Milo hears before dying is his friend Michael calling him for the first time by the name Lucian. With help from his swarm of bats, Michael Morbius flies into the night, while Martine's eyes open wide and glow red. In yet another world, Peter comes home one day to find Tony Stark waiting for him. The billionaire quickly reveals that he knows who Peter really is, Spider-Man. Spider-Man gained his power six months ago and quickly learned that when you have the power to help and don't, bad things happen and they're your fault.
Stark recruits Peter to help in a fight against Captain America. The UN is preparing to pass the Sokovia Accords, which would establish a panel to oversee the Avengers. Stark supports it, while Captain America and others do not. This conflict has led to a minor civil war between the heroes. Stark's head of security, Happy Hogan, brings Peter to Berlin, where he finds Tony has built him a new suit. Then, Peter lends Tony and his team a hand when they battle Captain America's team at an airport. When the battle ends and Tony sees how truly dangerous the conflict has become, he sends Peter home. You're done, all right? When Tony drops him off, Peter asks if he's an Avenger now, and Stark disappoints, saying no, but he'll call if they need him again. In 2012, after the Battle of New York between the Avengers and an alien army, Adrian Toomes and his crew win a contract to clean up the mess left by the battle. But another group takes over. After buying trucks and hiring a new crew, Toomes loses the job to the Department of Damage Control, a joint venture between Stark Industries and the federal government. Losing the job means financial ruin for Tombs, and in retaliation, he and his crew decide to hold on to some of the alien technology they salvaged, rather than turn it in like they're supposed to. Four years later, Tombs and his crew have used all the alien tech to develop weapons and devices, which they sell on the black market. Tombs himself uses their flying vulture machine to get around. Two months after the Avengers Civil War, Peter checks in with Happy to see if Tony needs him on any more missions. Though, just like his many prior attempts, Happy ignores the message, and Peter continues his relatively ordinary life. He's picked on by Flash Thompson, his high school's homecoming dance fast approaches, he hangs out with his best friend Ned, and he pines after his crush, Liz. At lunch, when Peter stares a little too long, Michelle gives him a hard time and calls him a loser. Later, Liz and the rest of the academic decathlon team are disappointed when Peter announces he'll be skipping the competition. He uses his usual excuse that it's because of an internship at Stark Industries, but in reality, he's too busy being Spider-Man. Though, he gets bored with petty crimes and hopes for another Stark-sponsored mission. His boredom is short-lived when he spots a group using alien technology to rob ATMs. He fights the thieves, but a misfire from their alien rifle destroys Peter's favorite deli across the street. Peter rushes over to help the owner out of the building. Peter returns home and sneaks through his bedroom window before removing the mask, then turns to see Ned waiting for him and realizes he's just given away his secret identity. He gets his friend to swear he'll keep it quiet, though the next day, in gym class, they overhear Liz admit she has a crush on Spider-Man, and Ned can't help himself. Peter knows Spider-Man! Flash is of course skeptical, and sarcastically suggests Peter bring Spider-Man to Liz's party. Liz says that Peter's welcome to come, but assumes he's too busy. At the party, they run into Michelle. Can't believe you guys are at this lame party. But you're here too. Then Liz finds them and she's happy they came. When Flash makes fun of Peter for pretending he knows Spider-Man, Peter decides to prove it. Outside, he changes into his Spidey outfit. Just as he's having second thoughts, he spots a strange blue explosion in the distance and quickly realizes webs don't work so well in the suburbs. So he runs. Peter finds a couple of Tombs dealers trying to sell high-tech weapons. Spider-Man shows himself, and they drive off, while firing back at him with their alien gear. When he almost catches the dealers, he's grabbed by the vulture. Peter escapes his grasp and plummets into the bay, where he's rescued by Iron Man. Well, actually an Iron Man suit, remote-controlled by Stark. He tells Peter to forget about the weapons trade and the vulture guy. There are other people to handle this sort of thing. Afterward, Peter finds a piece of alien gear they left behind. Toomes returns to his base of operations and steps out of the vulture gear. Then, he fires his dealer for shooting their weapons out in the open. The dealer, who calls himself the Shocker, threatens to spread the word that Toomes is the one behind the operation. So, Toomes kills him. Then, he hands one of his men Shocker's weapon and tells him to find out what they lost out there. The next day in shop class, Ned and Parker break open the device and find a small glowing object in it. Meanwhile, Toomes' men track the device to the school. Peter evades them and fires a tracker onto one of the men. With Ned's help, he tracks their movements to Maryland. 
So Peter decides to join the academic decathlon's trip to D.C., which will get him close to Maryland so he can investigate. On the way, Happy calls to check why Peter's leaving the city, and Peter tells him it's for school, nothing to worry about. Once they arrive, Ned helps Peter hack his suit so Stark and Happy can't track him, and won't find out about his trip into Maryland. Ned also notices something called the Training Wheels Protocol, which prevents Peter from accessing many of the suit's features. At Peter's begging, Ned unlocks them. On his way out of the hotel, Peter bumps into Liz and others sneaking out for a swim. She invites him to join, but duty calls. So, as usual, Peter misses out. When he puts the suit on, he immediately notices some changes. For one, he now has an AI assistant that directs him toward his tracker. The AI also gives him heat vision and super hearing, which reveals that a couple of the Vulture's goons are about to commence a heist. The AI asks if he'd like to activate enhanced combat mode, and of course he does. But when he tries to use his web shooters, they release a rapid fire attack instead, the default for enhanced combat mode. He sets the webs back to normal, then spots the vulture breaking into an armored truck to steal more tech. Then Peter tries to attack, but their fight ends quickly with Peter concussed and unconscious in the back of the truck. He wakes up and breaks out to find himself in a large warehouse. The suit informs him it's the Damage Control Deep Storage Vault, the most secure facility on the eastern seaboard, courtesy of Stark's joint venture with the government. While waiting for the facility to open in the morning, Peter chats with the suit, who he ends up naming Karen. He also practices with all of the new unlocked features. Growing impatient, he looks for tools he can use to get out. He finds an object similar to the glowing one he left with Ned, and Karen tells him it's an explosive Chitari energy core. Peter frantically attempts to reach Ned and warn him, but there's no service in the vault. Working with Karen, he manages to hack the lock and escape. While Peter rushes back to DC, his team wins the championship without him. Then, they head into the Washington Monument for a tour, where Ned's backpack containing the energy core runs through the x-ray machine at security. The radiation activates the bomb. As they ride up the elevator, the bomb detonates and damages the structure around them. In minutes, the elevator will collapse. Peter races up the monument. Karen releases a drone from his suit to find the best entry point, and Peter breaks in, just in time to catch the elevator and save his friends, including Liz. Meanwhile, after years of no issues with the Avengers, Toombs is aggravated by the attention from Spider-Man and vows to kill him. Back in school, Peter ditches class to continue his investigation. Unsure what to do next, Karen helps him review footage of his run-in with the Shocker a few nights ago and identifies the weapons buyer as Aaron Davis. Peter visits the man and he doesn't hesitate to help. Aaron knows how dangerous the alien weaponry is and would prefer it off the streets, especially since he has a nephew in town. He tells Peter what he knows. There will be another weapons deal at 11 on the Staten Island Ferry. Peter leaps onto the ferry and spots Toombs. Though he doesn't recognize him and neither does Karen, the man has no criminal record. Then the new Shocker meets with Matt Cargan, a criminal with a record including homicide. Shocker mentions a white pickup truck, so Peter sends his drone to find it, and he sees footage of the vehicle containing the enhanced weapons. Then he gets a call from Stark. Peter hangs up on him and attacks Shocker and Mac. But suddenly, FBI agents reveal themselves and point their guns at Spider-Man. Though, a more immediate threat emerges when the Vulture appears. Peter grabs the Vulture's gun but can't contain it, and accidentally breaks the Staten Island ferry in half. Spider-Man races to web it back together, but fails. Hope is nearly lost until Iron Man appears to save the day. Once things calm down, Tony chastises Peter for his irresponsible behavior. Peter tells him that he had to do something. Those weapons are out there and Stark wouldn't listen to him. But Stark did listen. He's the one who called the FBI. Stark tells Peter that this isn't working out and demands his suit back. Peter begs that he's nothing without the suit. And Tony tells him, if you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it. At home, Aunt May demands to know where Peter's been and why he keeps disappearing. He tells her that he lost a Stark internship after screwing up, and she comforts him. And at school, he goes back to just being Peter Parker. He bumps into Liz and apologizes for missing the decathlon. He also finally tells her how he feels. I like you. But she already knew that, and they decide to go to homecoming together. Back home, Aunt May teaches Peter how to dress, how to dance, and drops him off to meet Liz. 
At the door, he meets her father, Toombs. He must be Peter. He drives them to the dance and notes how familiar Peter's voice sounds, and it doesn't take him long to realize he has Spider-Man in his car. When they arrive, he tells Liz to head inside while he has the dad talk with Peter. She heads out and Toombs turns around with his gun. You saved my daughter's life, he says. I could never forget something like that, so I'm going to give you one chance. You walk through those doors, you forget any of this happened, and you don't ever, ever interfere with my business again. Because if you do, he adds, I'll kill you and everybody you love. That's what he'd do to protect his family. Peter nods and heads inside. Looking like a deer in headlights, Peter tells Liz that he has to go. Without Stark's suit, he puts on his old homemade costume and runs outside, only to find the shocker waiting for him. With Ned's help, Peter apprehends him. Then he quickly tells Ned to call Happy Hogan to let Stark know that Toombs is the vulture. Peter also tells him to track his phone, which he left in Toombs' car. Peter follows Ned's directions to Toombs' location. Meanwhile, Ned gives Happy a call, but Happy hangs up on him. Ned tells Peter that he saw a bunch of boxes behind Happy and that Happy mentioned taking off in nine minutes. Peter realizes that Toombs is likely planning to rob the plane full of Stark's tech. Peter gets to Toombs' location and asks how he can do this to his daughter, but Toombs explains that he sells the weapons so he can support her and his family. Then, his wings crash through the wall behind Peter, then destroy the surrounding beams to drop the roof on his head. Toombs leaves to go after the plane, leaving Peter buried in debris. In the collapsed building, Peter tries his hardest to lift himself up, but he's completely pinned down. Then, he remembers what Stark told him. If you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it. He lifts the debris and goes after the vulture. They fight on Stark's invisible jet until their battle crashes onto Coney Island. Vulture defeats Peter and flies off with a crate of weapons. But as the villain leaves, Peter notices his wingsuit is going to explode. Peter tries to save him, but Toombs fights him off. Then he crashes into the beach. Peter quickly dives into the ensuing flames and rescues him, then leaves him to be discovered by Mr. Hogan. Back at school, Liz tells Peter that with their dad going to trial, she and her mom are moving to Oregon. Then they tearfully part ways. With her gone, Michelle is made captain of the academic decathlon team and announces that she likes to go by MJ. When Peter excuses himself from the room, MJ's eyes linger on him as he leaves. Happy brings Peter to the new Avengers facility upstate. There, Stark gives Peter a new suit and officially welcomes him to the Avengers. Though Peter turns down the invitation. For now, he'd rather stay on the ground and look out for the little guy. Though, that leaves a press room full of people expecting an announcement. So, instead of announcing a new Avenger, Stark announces a new engagement. Back home, Peter finds Stark's previous Spider-Man outfit waiting for him, and when he puts it on, realizes Aunt May is behind him, revealing his secret identity again. What the f In prison, Toombs bumps into Mac Cargan, scarred after his run-in with Spider-Man. He has a lot of friends on the outside who would like to find Spider-Man and Mac heard a rumor that Toombs knows who he is. Toombs replies, If I knew who he was, he'd already be dead. The next year, on a class trip to MoMA, Peter spots a large ship floating above Manhattan. He quickly joins Iron Man, Doctor Strange, and Wong in a fight against Children of Thanos to prevent the retrieval of the Time Stone, which Thanos intends to use, along with the other Infinity Stones, to erase half the population of all living beings. Doctor Strange is captured and taken onto the ship. Spider-Man and Iron Man board it to rescue Strange. Deciding on their next move, Stark is adamant they take the fight to Thanos. Strange agrees, but assures that if it comes between saving Peter, Tony, or the Time Stone, he will not hesitate to let either of them die. Before heading off, Tony officially makes Peter an Avenger. They arrive on Titan, Thanos' now desolate home planet, where they run into the Guardians of the Galaxy. They fight at first, until they realize they're on the same side. Tony quickly tries to rally the group with a plan. Thanos is coming, and when he gets there, they'll need to wrestle the gauntlet from him, which he needs to use the stones. Meanwhile, Strange moves forward in time to view every possible future in the conflict with Thanos. Of the 14,605 futures he viewed, there is only one in which they win. 
When Thanos arrives, they fight as a team and subdue him. Moving quickly, Spider-Man and the others pull as hard as possible at the gauntlet. It slowly inches off the Titan's fist, until Quill learns that in exchange for the Soul Stone, Thanos killed Gamora, the woman Quill loves. Lost to his rage, Quill attacks Thanos, inadvertently waking him from Mantis' spell. Thanos frees himself from their grasp, fights them off, and nearly kills Stark, until Strange bargains for his life by handing over the Time Stone. Then, all Thanos needs is the Mind Stone, and minutes later, he has it. Thanos snaps his fingers. Half of all life vanishes, including Peter Parker. Sorry. 23 days later, the remaining Avengers find Thanos in the hopes of using the Infinity Stones to reverse the snap. But Thanos has destroyed the stones, and with no hope left, Thor kills him. Five years later, Tony Stark and the remaining Avengers travel across time and alternate realities to obtain Infinity Stones. Using their power, they reverse the snap and restore all the lives it took, including Peter's. However, their action draws the ire of Thanos from another reality. Peter joins the battle against his army. Humanity triumphs when Iron Man gets the gauntlet and snaps their enemy out of existence. However, the power of the Infinity Stones mortally wounds him. Peter tells Stark that they won, but his mentor has no breath left for final words. Peter weeps while Pepper tells her husband that he can finally rest. And although Peter mourns, his best friend is there for him when he returns home. Eight months later, Peter is back in high school, where the disappearance and return of half the world's population is being called the Blip. He prepares for a class trip to Europe, where he plans on confessing his feelings to his new crush, MJ. He often catches her staring at him and suspects that she may feel the same way. At a charity event run by his aunt, Peter uses his Spider-Man persona to help raise money. Afterward, he catches Happy and his aunt flirting. Then, Nick Fury calls and Peter ignores him, not wanting anything to disrupt his plans to get closer with MJ on the trip. Though not all is well. Peter still misses his mentor, Tony Stark. And when it's finally time to go, Peter leaves without his spider suit. On the flight over, his plan to get close to MJ doesn't go as planned. He ends up sitting next to his teacher instead, while MJ sits next to Brad, the kid who didn't disappear like Peter and most of the other students, so he's five years older and very popular. Things go better for Ned. By the time they land, he and Betty Brandt are officially boyfriend and girlfriend. At airport security, Peter is surprised to find May packed his spider suit for him. On the way to their hotel, Peter and MJ share a glance. In Venice, he buys a necklace which he hopes to give her. When they finally have a chance to talk, they're interrupted by a massive wave which takes the form of a large human. It crashes into nearby buildings, threatening bystanders. Peter is unsure how to fight the creature made of water, but suddenly a mysterious hero comes to the rescue. Watching news footage of the hero later, the students take to calling him Mysterio. Later, Nick Fury shows up in Peter's room and tells him about recent attacks around the world, from anthropomorphic weather, like the cyclone with a face that wiped out a village in Mexico. Nick also hands Peter a pair of glasses left for him by Stark. Then he takes him to an underground hideout and introduces Quentin Beck, the man who stopped the water. Beck explains that he's from another universe where his Earth was destroyed by elementals, or creatures born from the primary elements, air, water, fire, and Earth. Having destroyed air, water, and Earth, the only one still remaining on Peter's world is fire, the strongest of all, the one that destroyed Beck's Earth and took his family. The elemental will be in Prague in a few hours, and they want Peter's help. All of the other powerful heroes are unavailable. But Peter desperately doesn't want to miss his trip, and Fury seemingly allows him to return to his friends. However, Fury pulls some strings behind the scenes to get Peter's trip diverted to Prague. On the way, Peter tries on Tony's glasses and reads the note that came with it. For the next Tony Stark, I trust you. P.S. Say Edith. And when Peter says Edith, 
it activates an AI and augmented reality system in the glasses. She explains that Edith stands for Even Dead, I'm the Hero, and adds that she has access to the entire Stark global security network. And Peter can immediately see its power. Just looking around the bus, Peter sees exactly what everyone is doing on their phones, including private communications. At a pit stop, Peter is called into a small shop where a woman orders him to remove his clothes. Spider-Man can't be seen on the class trip since it would pretty much give away Peter's identity, so she made him a new suit. But just as Peter drops his pants, Brad walks in and takes a compromising photo. Brad tells Peter that both of them are clearly into MJ, and Brad intends to show her the photo. She deserves the truth. Back on the bus, Peter quickly attempts to have Edith delete the photo off Brad's phone. But when she asks if he's a target and Peter says yes, a deadly drone launches from a satellite to kill Brad. Peter just barely manages to stop it. Then he catches his breath and gets Edith to delete the photo before Brad can show it to MJ. In Prague, Fury once again pulls Peter away from MJ. They go over the plan with Mysterio, who has adopted Peter and his friend's nickname. When the fire elemental attacks, Peter and Mysterio will stop it before it grows too big and draws power from the Earth's core. At that point, there'd be no stopping it. Peter worries about the danger this will put his friends in, and Fury points out his hypocrisy. Peter nearly blew his friends up with a drone strike. Clearly, he is not ready for the responsibility Stark left him. Later, Mysterio checks up on Peter to see how he's doing. He tells Peter how he understands the hard path he's on, and he makes Peter feel better. He also assures Peter that if he keeps his friends indoors for a few hours, they'll be safe. So Peter works with Edith to get them all tickets to the opera where they'll be safe. At the opera, MJ tells Peter she'll save him a seat next to her. But as always, Peter disappoints. He leaves to meet Mysterio. MJ spots him sneaking off and follows, which gives Betty the idea to ditch the opera and she drags Ned out too. They head to a nearby carnival while Spider-Man watches from above in his new suit. The fire elemental appears, and during the ensuing battle, Peter notices a strange, invisible barrier when he fires his web. When he pulls the web off the barrier, it rips a small device from it, which MJ finds. Peter rescues Ned and Betty from a Ferris wheel, while the elemental grows too large to stop. With few options left, Quentin prepares to sacrifice himself. He flies into the monster, destroys it from the inside, and miraculously survives. After the battle, Fury invites Mysterio to join their cause. He tells Peter that he'd like to have him too, but Peter will have to decide if he's going to step up or continue his reluctance. Mysterio invites Peter for a drink. As they talk, Peter has a realization. He is not suited to be the next Tony Stark, but Quentin Beck is. So Peter tells Edith to transfer access to Quentin, then hands Mysterio the glasses. And with it, access to Stark's global network of advanced data, satellites, and weapons. Peter leaves, and suddenly, many of the patrons at the bar disappear, revealing themselves to be holograms. To those that remain, Quentin says, See, that wasn't so hard. And they celebrate. He gives a toast, reminding them why they joined his crusade. All, including Quentin, are former disgruntled employees of Tony Stark. Beck himself invented advanced hologram technology, which Stark renamed Barf, then fired Quentin for being unstable. Beck toasts to each of them and their contributions. William created weaponized drones that integrate with Beck's hologram tech to combine illusions with real damage. Guterman concocted the story of a hero named Quentin from another world, and so on. With Stark gone, new heroes will need to step up to fill the vacuum. And these days, it doesn't matter if you're the smartest or most qualified. No one cares unless you wear a cape or shoot lasers from your hands. And Mysterio adds, Well, I've got a cape and lasers. With our technology and with Edith, Mysterio will be the greatest hero on Earth. Then everyone will listen. At the hotel, Peter celebrates the end of his mission, but is disappointed to learn the trip is ending as well. After the elemental attacks, the school is bringing the children back home. But Peter won't miss his shot with MJ, so he invites her to go out that night unsupervised. And before he can even finish asking, she answers, 
Yes. They meet in the lobby, both nervously try to contain their excitement, and outside, their hands nearly touch. Then, Peter decides to tell MJ how he feels. But it doesn't go exactly as planned. She interrupts to point out that she already knows he's Spider-Man, and assumes that's what he was going to tell her. Peter denies it, but MJ points out that she's been watching him, and it's obvious. She shows him the device she grabbed from his battle with the elementals, covered in webs, proving Spider-Man was there, not the night monkey as reported by the news. Peter has a heartbreaking realization, and asks if MJ was watching him only because she thought he was Spider-Man. She lies, answering, yeah, why else would she be watching him? Suddenly, the device activates, projecting a hologram of the Elemental. They realize the Elementals and Mysterio are fake, and Peter realizes he's handed an incredibly powerful weapon to a villain. At his hideout, Mysterio works on a plan to use Edith's network of drones in combination with his illusion tech to create a threat big enough to encompass all of London. He wants maximum casualties to ensure they get the world's attention with an Avengers-level threat, which Mysterio will appear to stop himself. There's just one problem. One of his drones is missing its projector. And if someone finds it, they could prove the entire thing a fraud. So he tracks it down and finds it in Peter's possession. Knowing that with Edith, Mysterio could easily spy on his phone, Peter heads to Berlin to tell Nick Fury what's happening in person. But as he explains things, Mysterio reveals that Fury and Peter's surroundings are an illusion. He toys with Peter in a dreamlike hologram environment. Peter is attacked by copies of Spider-Man, Mysterio, and the corpse of Tony Stark. The illusion is finally broken when Fury shoots Mysterio in the back. Fury tells Peter that Mysterio is trying to kill anyone who knows the truth, and asks who else Peter told. Peter admits that MJ, Ned, and probably Betty know. But this Fury is another illusion, and Peter has just given Mysterio his next targets. Then Peter is hit by a train. He manages to get on board and passes out. He wakes up at a holding cell in the Netherlands and easily breaks out. He borrows a phone to call for help. When Happy arrives, Peter asks him to say something that only he would know. So Happy reminds him of the time he caught Peter buying an adult film on pay-per-view at a hotel in Germany. On the plane, Peter freaks out about his recent screw-ups until Hogan gives him a pep talk, telling him how Stark second-guessed everything he did. The one thing Stark was sure of was his belief in Peter Parker. They take off for London, where Peter's friends await. In flight, Peter works with Stark's computer to modify his suit to prepare for battle with Mysterio's drones. In London, Mysterio continues to work with an oblivious Nick Fury, who believes there's an impending elemental attack. And Mysterio releases Stark's army of drones. Meanwhile, Happy sends Fury a coded message to warn that Mysterio is an imposter. Then, he and Peter go over the plan. Hogan will work on rescuing Peter's friends, while Peter will get inside Mysterio's illusion to find Quentin. Before they begin, Peter hands Happy the necklace he bought for MJ. Peter tells him to give it to her if anything happens to him. The attack begins. Illusions terrify the populace, while drones inflict real damage. As Fury and Maria realize Mysterio is a fake, they notice Spider-Man diving into the heart of the elemental attack. Inside, Spider-Man connects the drones with his web and uses his modified suit to electrocute them. The damage interferes with the illusion, and Peter spots Beck. Before he can reach the man, a drone takes him out. Happy tries to bring MJ and Peter's other friends onto the jet, but Mysterio destroys it. So, they run into a museum vault for protection. A drone begins drilling its way through, while Mysterio sends the rest of the drones after Spider-Man. But Peter fights through and reaches Mysterio. The villain hides in another illusion, but this time Peter is ready. He listens to his spider sense, or Peter Tingle, as Aunt May calls it, and begins taking out the drones. The AI prevents them firing, as Beck is in such close proximity it'd be dangerous, but Beck shouts for them to fire anyway. And as Peter continues fighting them off, one inadvertently shoots Mysterio. Peter reaches him, and the villain tries one more time to trick him. But Peter doesn't fall for it. He gets the glasses back, and Edith shuts down Mysterio's operation, saving his friends. As Mysterio dies, he tells Peter that people need to believe. And nowadays, 
they'll believe anything. After the chaos, Peter and MJ find each other. She shows him the necklace that Happy gave her on Peter's behalf, and she kisses him. And she admits that she wasn't just watching him because she thought he was Spider-Man. They kiss again, then return home as a couple. Meanwhile, Betty and Ned break up, but without any hard feelings. With Aunt May and Happy Hogan, things are a little more complicated. She saw them as just a summer fling while he thought they were dating. Then, for Peter, things get very complicated. One of Mysterio's men publicly releases a video of Quentin Beck moments before his death. Beck claims that he stopped the Elemental, but Spider-Man is threatening to kill him with Stark's drones. Then, J. Jonah Jameson from the DailyBugle.net accuses Spider-Man of murdering Mysterio, and he plays the rest of the Dead Man's tape, the part where he reveals to the world that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. What the f After the exhausting mission, Nick Fury and Maria Hill revert to their true forms. The Skrulls, Talos and Soren, covering for Fury while he's in space, building a complex aerospace defense system called Saber. Back on Earth, with his identity outed, Peter's life is thrown into chaos. Most of the public turns against him, and even the FBI suspects him of murder. Thankfully, his lawyer, Matt Murdock, reports that the charges are unlikely to stick. But the charges against Happy Hogan are another story. He is apparently accused of pilfering some Stark technology. Murdoch also warns that Peter will still have to worry about the court of public opinion. And as though on cue, Murdoch catches a brick thrown by one of the public's many Spider-Man detractors. Looking for a safer place to stay, Peter and May head to Hogan's place. Things are no calmer at school, where students and teachers vie for Peter's attention, some, including Flash Thompson, to profit off his fame and others to call him a murderer. Peter finds some respite with MJ on the school roof, though their almost kiss is interrupted by Ned. He and Peter optimistically discuss college plans. They hope all three of them will get into MIT, but if not, at least one of their backup Boston schools where they'll have a fresh start together. MJ is less optimistic, bashfully telling Peter that if you expect disappointment, then you can never get disappointed. Peter reassures her, but soon finds her pessimism warranted. Due to Peter's notoriety as a vigilante and his friend's association with him, they are rejected from MIT and every other school. Peter has an idea. He visits Doctor Strange and asks if they could change the past so the world never learned his identity. But that would be too dangerous, and Strange doesn't even have the Time Stone anymore. Feeling for the boy's plight, he offers a different spell, one that would make everyone forget his identity. As Strange casts the spell, Peter realizes the effect it would have. MJ will forget much of what they've been through together. So will Ned, May, and Happy. At Peter's request, Strange alters the spell mid-casting, but after so many modifications, it grows unstable. Before something catastrophic happens, Strange contains the spell. He tells Peter a hard truth. The problem isn't Mysterio. It's that Peter is trying to live two lives. And if he was rejected by MIT, and even after talking to them, admissions won't budge, that's it. Peter is shocked that talking to them is an option. So he runs off and tracks down the assistant vice chancellor on her way to the airport. As he nervously and poorly pleads his case, they are attacked by a villain from another world, Dr. Otto Octavius. He demands Peter tell him what he did with his machine, and when this world's Peter has no answers, the villain attacks him and the surrounding bystanders. Peter protects the civilians while fighting off Ock, but the vice chancellor's car is knocked off the bridge, and she's left inside the vehicle only suspended by one of Spider-Man's webs. While Peter is distracted trying to save her, Ock manages to grab him and grab some of the nanotech from his suit, which Peter uses to hack into the villain's arms and take control of them. Dr. Octopus is quickly subdued and also confused once he sees Peter's face. It's not the Peter he knows. Using the villain's metallic arms, Peter rescues the vice chancellor and she thanks him, recognizing that he's a hero and promising to speak with admissions about him and his friends. 
Then the Green Goblin arrives just before Peter and Ock are teleported to Strange's Sanctum Santorum. Strange explains how before he shut down the spell, it apparently brought a few visitors from other worlds. Where they hoped to erase anyone's knowledge that Peter is Spider-Man, the spell instead brought from other universes anyone who knew Peter is Spider-Man. They'll have to capture them all and send them home. Peter already captured Otto, and while he was busy, Strange captured the Lizard. Peter recruits Ned and MJ to help in the task, and Ned couldn't be happier to be in the Sanctum Santorum. In fact, his Nana always said magic runs in his family. Scouring the web, they find evidence of more supervillain antics, and Peter goes after them to find Electro. After sucking up energy from a power line, the villain quickly overpowers Peter, but he gets help from an unexpected ally. Flint Marco. With his sand manipulation ability, Flint subdues Electro while Peter takes down the power line to cut off his supply. Using a device provided by Strange, Peter sends Electro to a cell in the Sanctum Santorum. When Flint demands to know what Peter did to Electro and moves threateningly, Peter sends him back too. In a back alley, Norman Osborn cowers as the Goblin demands he conquer this new world they've found. Norman destroys the goblin mask and runs off. Peter gets a call from May. She tells him that one of the visitors came to her shelter. Expecting another villain, Peter rushes over to find a sad and confused Norman Osborn. Finding himself in this strange world with no Oscorp, he saw Spider-Man in an ad for the shelter and came looking for help. He explains that sometimes he's not himself, and when he takes over, Norman wakes up with missing memories. He has no idea how he got here. He needs help, May explains, and if the other villains are like him, they need help too. Peter insists that it's not his problem, he needs to send them home. They return to the Sanctum Santorum. When Norman meets the others, some truths come out. Otto remembers Norman dying, and Sandman remembers them both dying, fighting Spider-Man. They realize that they were transported here in the moments before their death. Strange returns with a relic containing the spell. It will allow them to reverse it and send the visitors home. But Peter can't live with the idea of sending them back and condemning them to die. They need help, just like Aunt May said. Strange disagrees. These forces are too dangerous to meddle with. The visitors have to go home. If they die, they die. Strange prepares to reverse the spell, but before he can, Peter steals the relic. They fight over it, and Strange brings Peter to the mirror dimension. After a struggle, Peter works out the geometry of this alternate world, using it to trap Strange, steal his ring, and escape. Peter gives Ned the ring and announces that he is going to fix the villains, cure them of their various ailments. Then, when they go home, maybe they don't have to die. Norman offers to help, since he is something of a scientist himself. Peter hands MJ the box, so if things go south, she pushes the button and the visitors go home. Peter brings his new friends to Happy's place, where they can use his pilfered Stark tech to help cure the villains. While Peter and Norman work on a device to put Otto back in control instead of his arms, Flint and Max talk. Max likes the energy of this world and what it's turned him into, giving him back his body. And he thinks of what he could do with even more power. Peter and Norman finish their device, and it works. Otto returns to his old self. Next up is Electro. Peter equips him with a device to draw out the electricity and turn him back into Max Dillon. Suddenly, Peter senses danger. He closes his eyes to focus and finds the source of the threat. The Goblin has woken up. The Goblin announces that they don't need to be cured. These powers aren't curses, they're gifts. Max likes what he hears and removes the power-sucking device. Peter and Norman fight. But the Goblin Serum makes the villain impervious to Peter's attacks. The Goblin strangles Peter until May injects him with the cure. But the Anti-Serum fails, and the Goblin remains. He calls for his glider. It flies through Aunt May and knocks her to the ground. The Goblin offers that Peter can thank him later. Once he kills May, Peter will be free from his aunt's suffocating morality. Norman throws a bomb as he leaves, but Peter manages to stop it from reaching May. 
Peter and his aunt both struggle to stand, but reach each other and embrace. Peter apologizes. This was all his fault. No, May says. You did the right thing. They would have been killed. And she adds that Peter has a gift. He has power. And with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Then, her body remembers it was struck by Norman's glider. She is badly wounded. May collapses and dies in Peter's arms while he promises that she's okay. Cops surround the place. Happy parks between them and Peter, then gives himself up for arrest while yelling for Peter to run. Once they start shooting and he takes a bullet in the arm, Peter listens. Elsewhere, Ned and MJ wonder where Peter is and why he won't contact them. They realize Ned may be able to tap into the power of Strange's ring. He calls for Peter and opens a portal. It works, but it brings them a different Peter Parker. Like the villains, he too was brought to this world. So they try again and find yet another older Peter Parker, one who has been looking for their Peter. Ever since he got to this world, he had a sense that Ned and MJ's friend could use his help. Our help, the other Peter adds. The older Peter asks if their friend has a place he might go to get away from everything, the other Peter offers. MJ realizes where that would be and they find Peter on the school rooftop. Ned and MJ give him a much needed hug the other Peters offer their condolences and their experiences. They tell him what can happen if you lose yourself. One became rageful after losing Gwen, and the other sought revenge after losing his Uncle Ben. He got what he wanted, but it didn't make it better. Neither wants this world's Peter to make the same mistakes they did. Peter tells them what his aunt said about power and responsibility. The message resonates, and the older Peter assures that Aunt May did not die for nothing having taught him this powerful lesson. They get to work in the school science lab and develop cures for each of their villains. Before they leave, Peter quotes MJ, expect disappointment, but she corrects him, no, they're gonna kick some ass. Cure some ass, the older Peter corrects her. They head to the Statue of Liberty, where Peter calls the Daily Bugle to announce his location, hoping to lure the villains there. It works. The villains arrive, but fighting them all at once proves challenging, especially when the Peters have no experience working together. They find each other in battle to rework their strategy. They cannot coordinate without a way to identify each other. So, Peter offers, he'll be Peter 1, the older Peter is 2, and Peter 3 reluctantly agrees to be Peter 3. Before heading back into battle, Peter 3 grabs the others to say, I love you guys, and they reply, thank you. After that, they coordinate to all focus on one villain at a time. First, they cure Flint. Then, with some unexpected help from Otto, they cure Max, and then Dr. Connors. During the chaos, Dr. Strange finally returns through one of Ned's portals, and he's impressed to see Peter's plan to cure the villains is working, and he's impressed that Ned opened a portal. But the reunion is cut short by the goblin. He destroys Strange's relic containing the spell, and his bomb throws MJ from the structure. Peter leaps after her, but the goblin takes him out. So the other Peter, the one who couldn't save Gwen in that clock tower, catches MJ and saves her life. Peter takes down the goblin's glider, then stares at the man who killed his aunt and promises to return the favor. The other Peters watch as he beats Norman down, taking his first steps down the dark road they warned him against. Peter raises Norman's glider to plunge its blades through him until the older Peter gets in the way to stop him. He puts the glider down. Then Norman stabs the older Peter and taunts the younger Peter, telling him that he's the one who got his aunt killed. Peter 3 throws the anti-serum to Peter 1 and he plunges it into the goblin's neck, turning him back into just Norman Osborn. And Peter 2 promises he'll be okay. He's been stabbed before. Peter looks up to see their world tearing open. Beings from other worlds will soon pour into theirs and Strange can't stop them. The goblin destroyed the spell and the relic. Then Peter has an idea. They're coming here because of him because he is Peter Parker. He asks Strange to cast a spell which would make everyone forget who Peter Parker is. That would work, but Strange adds, 
you got to understand. That would mean that everyone who knows and loves you, we, we'd have no memory of you. It would be as though you never existed. Peter tells him to cast the spell, then prepares to say his goodbyes. First, the other Peters who are about to go home, then Ned and MJ. He tells them they're going to forget him, but promises it'll be okay. He will find MJ, and he'll explain everything. I'll make you remember me, he says. He starts to say I love you, but she stops him. Wait, she says. Tell me when you see me again. They kiss one more time, and Peter leaves as the spell works. The visitors return home, and the world forgets Peter Parker. On a snowy winter day, Peter visits MJ and Ned. He prepares to tell her the truth, then sees how happy they are. Both got into MIT. He puts away his prepared words and saves the truth for another day. Though he notices something in her eyes, a spark of deja vu. He leaves to visit Aunt May's grave and finds Happy Hogan, who now only sees him as a stranger. Happy wonders if everything May stood for is now gone. Peter promises it's not. Everyone she helped will keep it going. True to that promise, Peter moves into a small apartment and continues to be the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. But while Spider-Man may have sent all the visitors away, one left something behind. Eddie Brock. While he was on that beach with Venom, the symbiote told him about his 80 billion light years of hive knowledge across universes. Knowledge which includes that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Brock and Venom were brought into his world thanks to that spell, and when they left, a small piece of the symbiote was left behind. At the same time, the spell sent Venom home with a guest, Adrian Toomes. The villain known as Vulture finds himself transported from his usual prison cell on Peter's world to another on Venom's. In this other world, where he has no identity or criminal record, Toomes is freed. He builds or acquires a new Vulture suit, then finds Morbius and proposes a team-up. I'm not sure how I got here, he says. Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. I'm still figuring this place out, but I think a bunch of guys like us should team up. Could do some good. And Morbius replies, Intriguing. In another world, a boy named Miles Morales prepares for another day at Brooklyn Visions Academy. He passes by friends from his old school and wishes he was among them. But he passed the test, won the charter school lottery, and his parents won't let him squander the opportunity. You want to end up like your uncle? His father asks. What's wrong with Uncle Aaron? Miles responds. He's a good guy. But his father, police officer Jefferson Davis, knows better. He knows that his brother Aaron wound up on the wrong side of the law. We all make choices in life, he explains. It doesn't feel like I have a choice right now, Miles shouts. And his father replies, you don't. At school, Miles drowns in work. But on the bright side, he does hit it off with a new girl. And he makes a feeble attempt to escape purposely flunking an exam. The teacher knows better though. The only way to score a perfect zero on a true or false test is to know all the answers. Miles walks away with a 100 and a new assignment. Write an essay on what kind of person he wants to be. That night, he begins the essay, Great Expectations, then has a better idea. He visits someone who doesn't make him feel pressured by expectations. Uncle Aaron. His uncle takes him to an abandoned area of the NYC subway system, where Miles can throw up some of his art, a testament to no expectations. But before leaving, he's bit by a strange, glitching spider marked 42. The next day, just like the others before him, Miles discovers new spider powers. He's stronger and stickier, something he learns when his hand gets caught in the new girl's hair, ripping out a chunk of it. But at least he learned her name, though the name she gave is sort of obviously a fake one. I'm Gwanda. At night, he returns to the tunnels, hoping to learn more. He overhears a struggle and heads toward it to find Spider-Man fighting the Green Goblin. Miles ends up in the middle of it, but the hero protects him. 
You're like me, Spider-Man realizes, thanks to their shared spider sense. He tells Miles to stick around after the fight so he can show him the ropes. But it doesn't go that way. Spider-Man holds his own against the Goblin, but finds himself in trouble once Prowler joins the fight, and he fails to stop the machine. A machine controlled by the man whom the villains work for, Wilson Fisk, aka Kingpin. As the Super Collider comes to life, Brooklyn is struck by earthquakes and glitches, but when the Goblin sticks Spider-Man's head into the Collider's beam, it collapses. And so does Spider-Man. He weakly hands Miles an override key and asks him to promise he'll destroy the machine. Otherwise, Kingpin will continue his experiments and destroy everything. Miles makes the promise, then hides while Kingpin unmasks Peter Parker and strikes a final lethal blow. Miles stumbles, inadvertently attracting Kingpin's attention, so the crime boss sends Prowler to kill the witness, and Miles narrowly escapes. Rather than return to his dorm, Miles goes home, though he doesn't dare mention his new powers. After all, his father, a police officer, has never been fond of the vigilante known as Spider-Man, and he isn't too happy to find Miles apparently running from school. But his mother sees that the boy needs his home right now and lets him stay the night. News breaks of Spider-Man's death, and the next day, New York City mourns their hero, including Mary Jane, who speaks at his memorial about how everyone has power of one kind or another. In our own way, she says, we are all Spider-Man, and we're all counting on you. Miles takes those words to heart. He will be the next Spider-Man, but in practicing to take on the mantle, he only succeeds in breaking the override key. He failed, and visits Parker's grave to apologize. Maybe he can't stop the machine after all. But he isn't the only one at the grave. A dark figure grabs his shoulder. Surprised, Miles instinctively uses a power he didn't know he had the Venom Blast, and this mystery visitor at Peter Parker's grave turns out to be Peter Parker, an older Peter from another universe, a universe where he buried his aunt and separated from his wife MJ when she wanted kids and he got scared. It seems that Kingpin's super collider reached across dimensions and brought him here. Miles begs for his help in stopping the collider. Peter is only interested in going home, but the ever-present, nagging sense of responsibility won't allow it. He'll teach Miles to be Spider-Man and help him stop the Collider. First, they'll need a new key. So they head to Alchemex, where this world's Peter found his. They sneak inside and get caught by a scientist named Olivia, though Miles' fight-or-flight instinct kicks in, revealing another power invisibility. While he steals her computer, Peter turns on the charm, until he learns that this dimension is tearing apart his foreign cells, and he'll soon disintegrate. The scientist tells him all of this with glee, so it's no surprise when Peter learns her full name, Olivia Octavius, or Doc Ock. The two Spider-Men fight their way out, hit a bystander with a bagel, and Peter teaches his protege how to swing. Ultimately, they escape with help from an unexpected ally, Spider-Woman, the girl from Miles' school who reveals her true name, Gwen Stacy. In her world, she saved her dad but couldn't save her best friend Peter Parker. Now, she doesn't do friends anymore. Kingpin's Super Collider also brought her here, but also sent her back in time a week, and her spider sense told her to visit Vision's Academy, where she found Miles. The heroes leave, while Kingpin vows to have their heads, because he can't let them stop him from reuniting with his family, a family that Spider-Man took from him. One day, while fighting the web-slinger, his wife and son came home to find him brutalizing the hero. They ran in shock and got in a car accident, killing them both. Now Kingpin's only hope is to use the Collider to pluck another Vanessa and Richard from some other world. On the bus, Gwen and Miles talk. Both find relief in knowing they aren't alone as spider people, and Miles offers that if she reconsiders her no friend policy, he'd gladly sign up. Their next stop is Aunt May's house, 
where they hope to use the deceased Peter's equipment to build a new key, but they aren't the first ones to pay her a visit. Apparently, Kingpin's Collider brought three other visitors too. Peter Parker, or Spider-Man Noir, Penny Parker, or SPDR, and Peter Porker, or Spider-Ham, the spider who got bit by a radioactive pig. And they already know what must be done. The Collider can get them home, but someone will have to stay behind to shut it down. A sacrifice. Because staying in this world would kill any one of them. Their otherworldly molecules cannot stay intact in this other dimension. But maybe they can live. Because this is Miles' world. He can stay behind. And he is powerful, Peter explains. He can venom blast and turn invisible. The others watch, with disappointment, as Miles fails to perform either ability on command. As they test him further, Miles is overwhelmed by the weight of expectation. As he turns invisible and leaves, it becomes clear that he is young, inexperienced, and not up for the job. One of them will have to stay behind. Miles once again turns to the one he's always looked up to, Uncle Aaron. He waits at the apartment, and soon someone arrives. Prowler. The villain removes his mask. It's his uncle. Miles' uncle Aaron is Prowler. He runs back to Aunt May's house, where Penny has finished building a new key. He tells them about Prowler, and too late, realizes he's been followed. They're attacked by Kingpin and his people, and before long, Prowler has the young Spider-Man cornered, and the kid takes off his mask. It's his nephew. He can't kill his nephew, but if he disobeys orders, he himself will be killed. It's an easy choice. Fisk's bullet finds Aaron's spine. Miles swings him to safety in a back alley and watches him die, but not before Aaron can share a few last words, an apology for letting down his nephew, and an assurance. You're the best of all of us, Miles. You're on your way. Just keep going. Miles returns to his dorm, and the others find him to say their goodbyes. How will I know when I'm ready? Miles asks. You won't, Peter answers. It's a leap of faith. He leaves the boy restrained to a chair, with his mouth webbed shut so he won't be tempted to follow them. And soon, Miles receives another visitor. His father. He comes to share the news of Aaron's passing. But Miles, of course, can't speak or open the door. Assuming the boy is ignoring him, Jefferson does all the talking. He tells Miles that he doesn't want them to drift apart. And he tells Miles that he sees a spark in him. But that spark is his to do with as he pleases. He does have a choice, Miles realizes. So, he makes it. Miles venom blasts his way out of the webbing, visits May for a new costume, and takes a leap of faith. By the time he arrives at the Collider, the fight has already begun. But with Miles' assistance, they turn the tide against Kingpin and his henchmen. Peter is proud of Miles. It's a good feeling and makes him realize maybe he does want kids after all. They defeat Hammerhead, Scorpion, and finally Doc Ock giving Miles a chance to use the key to open a portal. One by one, the visitors return home. Before Gwen leaves, she takes Miles' hand and formally accepts his friendship. Once it's just Peter and Miles, Kingpin makes his appearance. Maybe it was too good to be true, and it'll take a hero's sacrifice after all. I'll hold him off while you shut this down, Peter shouts. But that wasn't the deal. Peter, you gotta go home, Miles insists and he sees the truth. Peter is afraid. How do I know I'm not going to mess it up again? Peter asks. You don't, Miles responds. And Peter smiles. It's exactly what he said earlier, a leap of faith. And if Miles can take one, so can he. Peter falls into the portal and returns home, leaving Miles to face Kingpin alone. Miles loses the fight, until he hears a distant voice. Get up, Spider-Man. It's his father. Officer Jefferson Davis finds himself rooting for the vigilante. The hero stands up and shows Kingpin just what this new Spider-Man can do. He shows him the Venom Blast. The villain is defeated. Miles shuts down the Collider and hands him over to the authorities. Afterward, Miles calls his father to reconcile, and Spider-Man tells Officer Davis that he looks forward to working with him. And returning home, 
Peter Parker arrives on MJ's doorstep with some flowers. As time passes, Gwen misses Miles and remembers how she got here, how she became Spider-Woman, how her best friend Peter tried to be special like her, but only managed to turn himself into the lizard, how he died in their brawl, and Gwen's father, Captain George Stacy, found Spider-Woman crouching over his body. He blamed the vigilante for killing his daughter's best friend and vowed revenge. Now, Gwen is alone, and the only one who really knows her is worlds away. But despite Gwen's pain, Spider-Woman has a job to do. There are reports of a vulture attack at the Guggenheim Museum, but it's not her vulture. This one is glitching. He must be from another world. And soon, there is another visitor, Miguel O'Hara, another Spider-Man from a world where it's the year 2099. He leads an elite strike force dedicated to the security of the multiverse. Outfitted with watches that allow travel between worlds without glitching, they set the multiverse in order by putting things back where they belong. Right now, he's cleaning up Gwen and Miles' mess. The super collider on Miles' world ripped a hole in the multiverse, letting people like Vulture get zapped randomly between worlds. Miguel and his team find these travelers and send them home. But this Vulture is more powerful than expected, so Miguel calls for backup. And another Spider-Woman appears, Jess Drew. Together, they apprehend the villain and save bystanders, including Captain Stacy, who uses the opportunity to finally arrest Spider-Woman, and she finally reveals her face. Gwen tells her father that she didn't kill Peter. His answer is blunt. You have the right to remain silent. Their conversation is cut short when Jess and Miguel hand Gwen her own watch and recruit her to their elite strike force. Meanwhile, Miles tussles with his own villain, The Spot, his self-appointed nemesis, a man without a face who gets his name from the many dark holes on his body, holes which act as portals. Objects enter one and exit another. The villain can even remove those holes and place them elsewhere to create portals at will, though he's still getting the hang of it. And so is Miles. After a confusing battle, he leaves the villain tangled in webs and joins his parents at a meeting with his guidance counselor, late as always. It quickly becomes clear, they all have very different ideas for Miles' future. He wants to study quantum science at Princeton, while his mother can't fathom the idea of her son leaving Brooklyn. But they'll have to work it out some other time, because already, the spot has freed himself. Hidden behind his mask, Miles teams up with his father to stop the villain, who explains how he created Spider-Man, and Spider-Man created him. One year ago, the hero threw a bagel at him. That's right, he was a scientist at Alchemex. They brought a spider from another dimension, which bit Miles, and the scientist was in the collider room when Spider-Man blew it up, turning him into the spot, which lost him everything, his job, his life, and his face. His rant is cut short when he vows revenge and falls through one of his own holes, which brings him into a strange space surrounded by more holes, each leading to another dimension, including Earth-688, home of Venom and Miss Chen, who is unimpressed by the villain. He returns home, excited by the knowledge that his spots put the power of the multiverse in the palm of his hand. But he's out of spots and heads off to make more. That evening, Miles' father celebrates his imminent promotion to captain, and once again, thanks to the never-ending supply of crime to be thwarted by Spider-Man, Miles is late. Of course, he can't tell his parents why. But Rio Morales and Jefferson Davis reach the end of their rope. They want answers, and if Miles won't give them, he is grounded for a month. He sulks in his room, but he isn't alone for long, because soon a portal opens above him, and out of it steps Gwen Stacy. She tells him about the elite squad of spider people. They can travel between worlds at will. She would have come here sooner, but they're pretty strict about where you're allowed to go. And she tells Miles about her father, how she revealed her identity, and it didn't go well. It takes no time for the two friends to pick up where they left off. 
Miles slides a hand toward Gwen's, while she tells him how things usually go between Gwen Stacy and Spider-Man. In every other universe, she falls for him, and it doesn't end well. Miles retracts his hand, but he's hopeful. There's a first time for everything. When Miles' parents drop in, Gwen awkwardly excuses herself and he shares a quiet moment with his mother. She's worried about him, but acknowledges that eventually she needs to let him go and live his own life. It is conditional though, he has to promise he'll take care of himself and never let anyone tell him that he doesn't belong. She temporarily lifts his grounding and lets him go after Gwen. He finds her snooping at a crime scene, the apartment belonging to Dr. Jonathan Owen, who now goes as The Spot. Gwen replays the scene. He was here earlier, collecting equipment to concentrate dark energy, enough to get him to a world containing a super collider. She gets a call from an unhappy Jess. Gwen let the spot get away because she was distracted, checking in on Miles, something she was forbidden from doing. He was never supposed to know she was here and cannot be a part of this. Miles watches invisibly as Gwen promises she'll never see him again. Once they track down the spot, she heads into a portal that'll take her to him, and Miles follows. They arrive in a world where Mumbatton exists in place of Manhattan, and team up with its Spider-Man, Pavitra Prabhakar. Gwen is annoyed that Miles followed her, but when they find the spot, they need all the help they can get. The villain arrives at Alchemex, where he can use its super collider for the ultimate upgrade. He traps the heroes behind a force field, but Miles has been refining his Venom Blast to absorb energy, then release it. He begins absorbing the force field, until a new ally appears and blasts through it, Spider-Punk. Or Hobie, the guy whose dimension Gwen sometimes crashes in, and whose apartment currently contains her sweater and toothbrush. But even with Spider-Punk's help, they're too late. The spot activates the collider, and in a blast of energy, reveals to Miles their shared future. A future where the spot is powerful, powerful enough to visit Miles' world and destroy it, to take everything from Miles, the way Miles took everything from him. See you back home, Spider-Man. The spot bids farewell and vanishes. The building collapses. The spider people move quickly, protecting nearby civilians. Pavitra saves his girlfriend, but her father, Inspector Singh, is in danger too. He can't save both, but he doesn't need to, because Miles is there. Gwen argues futilely that it's too dangerous, before Miles leaves her and rescues the police inspector. The crowd cheers, but Gwen knows there's little reason to celebrate, because their actions will have immediate consequences. The universe begins to glitch, and a quantum hole begins spreading. Jess and a few others arrive to try and contain it, while Gwen and Miles are called to headquarters. A place on Miguel O'Hara's homeworld, filled with spider people from other dimensions. They lend Miles a day pass to stop him from glitching, and provide a quick tour, including a room filled with pods containing villains who have traveled between dimensions, and the go-home machine, which can read DNA and send them back to their home worlds. The HQ is filled with friendly faces, including Peter Parker, the one Miles met a year ago, who now has a daughter, but there are also some not-so-friendly faces, including Miguel O'Hara himself, who is anything but happy to see Miles. He tells Miles about canon events, things that happen to every Spider-Man, things that must happen, like losing an uncle to learn responsibility, or event ASM-90. A police captain close to Spider-Man dies saving a kid from falling rubble during a battle with an arch nemesis. By saving Inspector Singh, they prevented a cannon event. They created an anomaly, which risks destroying that entire world, something Miguel learned firsthand. He found a world where he was happy with a family. When that world's Miguel was killed, he took his place, and soon his meddling in the other dimension led to its destruction. Miles realizes something. His dad is about to be captain. He demands to know when it'll happen, and Miguel acquiesces. The model predicts that Miles' father will die in two days. 
Miles decides he will stop it. Miguel tells him that he can't, and so does everyone else, including Peter and even Gwen, accepting that her own father, Captain George Stacy, will soon suffer the same fate. When they see that Miles won't be convinced, Miguel restrains him in a force field. But this Spider-Man is different from the others. This one has Venom Blast. Miles frees himself and runs. While he's chased by an army of spiders, Peter pulls him aside and tries to talk him down. He tells Miles how he had a kid thanks to him. He thought if he could do a good enough job raising her, she might turn out like Miles. But it doesn't matter. Nothing will stop Miles from saving his father. So the chase continues. Miguel tears away his day pass and tells Miles the truth. Miles is the original anomaly. He was bit by a spider from another dimension, a dimension that is now without a Spider-Man thanks to him. If Miles wasn't bit, his Peter would have lived and stopped the collider before it went off, and the spot wouldn't exist. Miles looks at his friends. They knew. Gwen knew. Peter knew. That's why they never came to see him. It's just what his mother warned him about. Out here, the only one who will protect Miles Morales is Miles Morales. So he does. He tells Miguel the crucial error he's made. By sending every Spider-Man after Miles, he's left HQ unguarded. Miles Venom blasts Miguel, makes his way back, and enters the go-home machine. Miguel tries to stop him, but the machine's handler, Spider-Bite, sees something in Miles' eyes, more powerful than her boss's orders, and lets him go. Miguel kicks Gwen out of the group, sending her back to her home world, and recruits a team to track down Miles. Back home, Miles is relieved to find that his mother is okay. The spot hasn't made his move yet, and he finally decides to tell her who he really is. He is Spider-Man. Her answer? Who's Spider-Man? Miles realizes something. He was bit by a spider from another world, whose DNA combined with his own. The spider was from Earth-42. That's where Miles was sent, a world without Spider-Man, where Uncle Aaron is alive and his father is dead, where Miles Morales is the Prowler. The villainous pairing of uncle and nephew capture the imposter for questioning and restrain him. Back home, Gwen reconciles with her father and learns that he's quitting, which means he won't be captain. Maybe the cannon will spare him after all. And there's more good news. While she was out, Hobie came to visit and left his watch in case she ever needed it. Gwen quickly travels to Miles' world, where Miguel and the others frantically search. But soon, she has the same realization as Miles. He is not on this world. He was sent somewhere else. She visits his parents and promises to find him. It won't be easy, but she won't be alone. She recruits a team composed of new friends and old, from Pav, Hobie, and Spiderbite to Peter, Penny, Ham, and Noir. While they prepare for their journey, Miles charges his Venom Blast to escape his restraints, and on his homeworld, the Spot watches over Brooklyn, ready to unleash his newfound powers. And that's where things wrap up. We'll find out what happens next in Beyond the Spider-Verse, hopefully in 2024, but rumor has it we might be waiting a little longer than that. Anyway, that is every Spider-Man. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Nicholas Hammond? Well, that was a TV series from the 70s, The Amazing Spider-Man. I'm only doing the movies. Yeah, the first episode was technically a movie, but it was a TV movie, not theatrically released. Okay, it was theatrically released outside North America. All right, let's do this one last time. In this world, Peter Parker is a student at New York State University and a part-time photographer at the Daily Bugle working for J. Jonah Jameson, who is never satisfied with his work. But that'll soon be the least of his problems. In the school lab, he completes an experiment involving radiation, and a spider gets caught in the crossfire, and the irradiated arachnid bites Peter, giving him spider sense, strength, and the ability to climb walls, which is just in the nick of time, because after he leaves the lab, a couple of bank robbers nearly hit him with their car, and Peter's new powers save him. 
and as the first one on the scene, he's able to nab some great photos too, but also attract the attention of Captain Barbera. After a restless night at Aunt May's house, Peter further tests his powers, and when the public spots a man climbing on the side of a building, they deem him the Spider-Man. Inspired by the moniker, Peter stitches himself a costume and takes some pictures. Though Jameson is skeptical, are they real? And if they are, what's this Spider-Man guy up to? The answer? Saving the day, Peter is sent to take a photo of a car crash. A Professor Noah Tyler robbed a bank, then drove into a wall. With his spider strength, Peter is able to rescue him from the vehicle, and once again, land in Barbara's crosshairs. Why does Peter keep showing up at every crime scene? But that's less confounding than the other question. Why do seemingly normal people keep robbing banks? Professor Tyler is just the latest in a long string of similar crimes. Peter accompanies the professor's daughter Judy to the hospital, where after they leave, things get even stranger. Her father tries jumping out the window, but Spider-Man comes to the rescue, and when Peter returns to Judy's side, she's flabbergasted. Where were you? You missed everything. Why would this professor do something so crazy? Judy reveals that he recently visited a spiritual guru, Edward Byron. Peter and Judy pay him a visit. She is impressed by him, but Peter is skeptical. Maybe Byron has something to do with the crime. Afterward, having seen the heights Spider-Man will take him to, Peter adds another tool to his arsenal, web shooters. And soon, Byron officially seals himself as Spider-Man's first villain, because he is no ordinary guru. He's developed mind control tech and has been using it to force innocent people to commit crimes on his behalf. And he's gotten greedy, writing an extortion letter to the mayor, taking responsibility for the crimes, and demanding $50 million, or else he'll mind control 10 everyday New Yorkers and order them to jump to their deaths Friday at noon. As Peter puts the finishing touches on his web shooters, he picks up a strange signal, something related to the mind control tech. As Spider-Man, armed with webs, he traces it, fights past henchmen, and realizes that Byron's therapy center is its source. He is the mind controller. When Peter returns to investigate further, Byron uses the machine on him, adding Peter to the list of those who will die Friday. In the meantime, Peter continues his investigation. He figures out how the signal works, but he's much too late. It's Friday, and less than an hour remains until noon. Byron beams a signal. Throughout the city, particular citizens make their way onto bridges or the tops of buildings, ready to take their last steps at noon, including Peter, who makes his way up the Empire State Building, and Judy, who stands on the edge of a subway track, ready to throw herself onto it. Noon approaches. As Peter makes his way over the guardrail, a pin falls off his jacket. The pin Byron placed there, which receives his signal. Spider-Man is freed of his grasp and moves quickly, taking out the satellite which transmits the signal. And now, the others are freed too. Spider-Man finds Byron. Destroying the satellite reversed the signal, so he's been left in a trance and open to programming. Spider-Man orders him to turn himself in. And he does. The day is saved. Peter gets some great photos of Spider-Man, and he and Judy are really hitting it off. Thus begins Peter's career as the crime fighter known as Spider-Man. A career which probably makes Miguel furious, because it doesn't seem to adhere to any canon events at all. There's no Uncle Ben, no police captain's tragic death, no Gwen Stacy or MJ, though there is a Julie Masters, another photographer who eventually works with Peter. This Spider-Man might be a little different from the others, but is like them in the most important way. He stops plenty of criminals. Everything from a scientist who makes evil clones, to a telekinetic thief who leads a religious cult. But often, his villains are more mundane. 
an imprisoned politician who poses as a reformed humanitarian to stage a prison breakout and steal $100 million, paranormal fraudsters who tried to take a widow's money by impersonating her late husband. That particular case, by the way, got a little wild, even requiring Spider-Man to tame a lion. The last time we saw him, this version of Spider-Man took a trip to Hong Kong to clear the name of Mr. Jameson's old college buddy, Min Lo Chan, who was falsely accused by the Chinese government of spying during World War II. Like every case before this one, Parker solved it and returned to his status quo. Where is he now? I like to believe he's still out there in the Spider-Verse, fighting crime, and in fact, if you look closely at Spider-Verse Issue 2, you'll notice an arm wearing a familiar web shooter on its wrist. And if you think we're done, you're as mistaken as J. Jonah Jameson questioning the scruples of one masked vigilante known as Spider-Man. Because across the globe, in another dimension, there's another Spider-Man, motorcycle racer Takuya Yamashiro. It all starts when an alien ship called the Marveller crash lands on Earth. Takuya's father, a professor in astroarchaeology, searches out the vessel for research, something of no interest to Takuya. All he believes in is the sound of the motorcycle which vibrates through you. But today, he hears a new sound, a voice in his head which calls out to him and appears in the form of a spider. It soon calls him to the crash site, where he finds his father mortally wounded. With his dying breaths, he tells his son about a group that's been secretly trying to invade Earth. He begs his son to stop them, and he dies in his arms. It seems that no Spider-Man is safe from their tragic canon, for the most part. Soon, Takuya is surrounded by the same Iron Cross army that killed his father. He is wounded in the battle and falls to a cave, where he meets the source of the voice in his head, a man named Garia from the planet Spider. Garia saves the wounded man by administering spider extract, then finally explains exactly what's going on. 400 years ago, Planet Spider was invaded by Professor Monster, leader of the Iron Cross Army. Garia came to Earth seeking revenge, but he fell right into the Professor's trap, a cave of poisonous spiders. And for centuries, he endured on the edge of life and death, waiting for someone to pick up his telepathic message, waiting for someone to inherit the powers of Spider-Man and the grudge of Planet Spider. The weakened Garia collapses and becomes a spider. Takuya Yamashiro leaves the cave with newfound power thanks to the spider extract and a vow to avenge Garia's people and his father along with them. And as he faces the Iron Cross army, he'll have help. Spider Garia telepathically explains that he can use his spider bracelet to put on his spider protector, and he can use the Marveller, the ship Garia summoned with his telepathy. With spider sense, he tracks down his enemy, and when they ask who he is, he answers, an emissary from hell, Spider-Man. But when he finds himself outmatched against Professor Monster's giant-sized machine bem, he calls on the Marveller for help. Spider-Man boards the ship, and it transforms into Leopardon, a robot equal in size to Machine Bem. He wins the battle, but his war against the Iron Cross army has only just begun, a war that continues to this day, something we learned when we glimpsed his world in the Spider-Verse comics. It's even rumored he'll appear in the next Spider-Verse movie, but we'll have to wait and see. Okay, for real this time, that wraps things up for now. If you enjoyed this video, you might also enjoy my full chronological recap of the MCU. Check it out in the upper right corner. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more. I'll keep updating this video as more Spider-Man movies come out, so be on the lookout. With that, thank you for watching, and see you on the next One Take.